I'd just climbed back into the room when suddenly I heard a voice. Jasmine, how come you're only getting home now? I turned around to find Emma standing there. That's my business. Don't come home late like this again, okay? You'll be grounded if your dad finds out. I shrugged and closed my door without saying anything. Yep, that's Emma, my stepmom. She doesn't actually care, she just pretends to. If it wasn't for her telling my dad to forbid me from singing, then I wouldn't have to sneak out to go practice like this. Different day, same story. Yet again, I've had to lie about going to my singing practice. Honestly, I can't wait to be an adult so I can do whatever I want. Dad, I'm going over to Mix to study, I said as I headed for the door. Suddenly, Emma pulled me back and handed me a bottle. Huh? Licorice tea? Drink this after practicing. It helps keep your voice clear. Then she winked at me. Huh? So she knew I'd lied about where I was going, yet still she'd helped me? Maybe, just maybe, I've been misunderstanding her this whole time? Later that night, Emma suggested we should go for a picnic on the weekend, and for once, I excitedly agreed. But when the weekend rolled around, there was this hectic snowstorm. Ugh. Emma kept looking out at the snow, with disappointment written across her face. Ugh. That's when the idea hit me. How about we have an indoor picnic? Yes, that's right. That's a great idea. And so, we set up the tent right in our living room, and we were having the best time, when suddenly, the doorbell rang. I got up to answer it, and standing there, covered in snow, was a woman. She suddenly ran at me and said, Oh my gosh, Jasmine, you've grown up so fast! I've missed you so much! Before I could understand what was going on, Dad shouted, Megan, I can't believe you have the nerve to show up here like this! I know you won't accept my apology, but you don't understand. I had to see her. I've missed her every single day. Oh my god. So, that woman was my mother? I couldn't hold back my tears and ran straight over to hug her. I swear I had been waiting for this moment for years. Mom gently stroked my hair and then turned to my dad. Can I stay here for a while? Just to make it up to my beloved daughter after such a long time being apart, Elvis. Are you joking? Get out of my house. Dad, please let her stay. Please. But no matter how much I begged, Dad wouldn't give in. And so I turned to Emma for help. Elvis, just let her stay here. If Jasmine wants to be with her mom this badly, we should let them have some time together. Come on, darling. I looked at Emma with so much appreciation, then turned those puppy eyes towards my dad, and eventually he reluctantly nodded his head. Yay! I shouted and led Mom to my room. From that day onwards, I spent most of my free time with her. We went to the movies together, shopping together, and honestly, it was the happiest I'd ever felt. One day, I was listening and humming along to my music when Mom came in. Wow. So, you also love singing? It must be genetic. Back then, if I hadn't been so passionately obsessed with music, which drove your dad crazy, I might never have left you like that. Now I regret it so much, Jasmine. I put my arms around her and softly said, After all these years, I still think about that lullaby. Can you sing it to me? Which one? I sang you many lullabies back then. It's... Don't Know Why by Nora Jones. Oh, right. That one. Then she started singing. I swear to God, her voice was like an angel. But strangely, it didn't give me any of the feelings I had as a kid. Was it because I have grown up? While I was absorbed in my thoughts, I suddenly saw Emma's shadow at my doorway. But when she met my eyes, she hurried down the stairs. Huh? Why was Emma crying? I was so confused. She must be jealous of our relationship, Mom said. Yeah, probably, since she'd been married to my dad for three years, but we'd never been close. That evening, when I went to the kitchen with Mom to set the table, she suddenly shouted, Oh my gosh! Why did Emma make chicken parmigiana? Doesn't she know that your dad hates this? Then she took the plate and threw it in the trash, saying she would order takeaway instead. Huh? Dad hates this? He always complimented Emma on her signature dish. 
Before I could react, Emma entered the room. As soon as she saw her chicken in the trash, she glared at Mom. Things then got so awkward. Emma had skipped dinner. Mom also tried to start a conversation with Dad a few times, but he ignored her. Ugh, I felt so bad for Mom. In my dad's eyes, there was only Emma now. But my mother had done nothing wrong. She just wanted to pursue her passion. Later that night, I was heading to the pantry to get some snacks when I heard Emma yelling at Mom. Megan, for old time's sake, I didn't bring up anything from the past, but you can't just do whatever you want. How dare Emma yell at my mom like that? As soon as Emma left, I ran over to my mom asking her what had happened. She hesitated for a while, then told me the whole story. It turned out mom and Emma used to be in the same band when they were young. And since mom was always the lead singer, Emma had begrudged her ever since. Perhaps she has never gotten over it. Ugh, I didn't expect Emma to be so mean. So from that day on, I began to show my attitude towards Emma. I didn't let her go to the parent-teacher conference like I had promised before. And I even forbade Mick, my best friend, from talking to her every time he came over. Mom, how did you and Dad meet back in the day? Well, back then, your dad was a waiter at the lounge I used to sing at every weekend. We quickly fell in love and started leaving love letters for each other at our secret spot. Ew, how cheesy. It's called romantic, you silly. At that time, we put our initials at the end of every letter. Suddenly, there was some noise at the door, and I turned to see Dad standing right behind us. What do you mean, our initials? It represented our two favorite characters' names from that movie. Yes, it was the initials of Monica and Quincy in the movie Love and Basketball. Dad gaped at Emma in surprise as she continued. I was the one writing letters to you that year. But when I got to the meeting spot, I saw you and Megan together. So I left. Dad and Emma looked at each other, then turned to stare at Mom. Actually, back then I liked you so much that I pretended to be Emma. But it's not that important. In the end, you were still into me and we got along really well, right? I can't believe you lied to me like this for all these years! Then Dad angrily left the room, followed by Emma. As for Mom, she was sitting there, tears pouring from her eyes. Okay, so Mom was definitely in the wrong, but did Dad need to treat her like that? Who doesn't make mistakes from time to time? And anyway, it's because of my mom's mistake that I'm even here, right? From that day onwards, the atmosphere in the house was so intense. Dad ignored Mom, and Emma always gave Mom hateful looks. Until one day... I'd just gotten home from school when I saw my dad excitedly running towards me saying, Emma is pregnant. You're going to have a little brother or sister. Wow. I'd always wanted to have a sibling. I couldn't believe it. So that night, my family threw a party to celebrate. And mom also congratulated dad and Emma. And thanks to that, the tension between the three of them started to ease. Phew. But a few days later, for some reason, dad found out that I'd lied about going studying with Mick. He was furious and grounded me for a week. I was sullenly playing on my iPad when mom entered the room. Emma must be the snitch. Now that she's pregnant, she wants dad to be angry with you, so he'll give all his love to her and the baby. Well, that just made sense. The other day, I'd even seen Emma whispering something to dad, and as soon as he heard it, he got mad. Ugh, such a two-faced woman. I had to sort this out, and so I set up a fun plan for my stepmom. One time, I made her orange juice using powdered cheese, and she ended up spitting it out all over Dad. <laughs> then I unscrewed the shower head to add blue food coloring, and that's how I gave her a Smurf makeover. It was hilarious hearing her horrid scream from the bathroom. Another time, I snuck into Emma's room, trying to put flour in her hair dryer. I was rummaging through the bedside table looking for her hair dryer when suddenly I saw a DVD labeled Jasmine 0311. Huh? What's this? Why was my name on it? Curious, I went back to my room to play it. And then I couldn't believe my eyes. On the screen, Emma was carrying a baby and singing a lullaby to her. This melody. Wasn't it the song Don't Know Why? So that baby was me? But Emma couldn't sing, could she? Her voice was weak and sounded hoarse. What did this mean? I rushed to show my dad the DVD. Emma told me not to talk about this, but since you already know, I won't hide it anymore. Then he told me everything. 
Turns out my mom left for a rich man when I was only two years old, and it was Emma who came and helped my dad take care of me during my younger years. Oh my gosh. What? So all those memories of my mom's warm hugs and lullabies were all actually of Emma? A feeling of guilt welled up in my heart. I had to do something to apologize to Emma. So the next day, I asked Mick to go to the mall to help me buy her a gift. As I was passing a coffee shop, I suddenly saw my mom sitting with some guy. Without thinking much, I quickly pulled Mick to a nearby table and eavesdropped on them. Honey, how's the money? You know how pushy the creditors are, and they're getting kinda aggressive. Don't worry, it won't be long now. My daughter's on my side. She'll help me kick her stupid stepmom out. Then my ex-husband will soon follow her wish and volunteer to give me money. What? What was going on? Had mom come back just for dad's money? I was about to go confront her when my phone rang. It was dad. Jasmine, go to the hospital right away. Emma is in the emergency room. By the time I got there, I saw my dad sitting outside the ER with his head in his hands. After a while, the doctor came out and said, Both mother and baby are okay. Next time, please pay more attention to the patient's food allergy. How could you eat stuff you're allergic to? You must be more careful, okay? Yeah, Emma always took good care. It didn't make sense. Unless... my mom... I was about to tell dad about what I'd seen at the mall when mom suddenly appeared, eagerly asking about Emma's situation. Unable to stand her pretense any longer, I shouted, Mom, drop the act. It was you who did all of this, wasn't it? Jasmine, what nonsense are you uttering? Furious, I immediately told them the whole story I've heard. Megan, I could forgive you for the old letter story and for trying to sabotage my voice, but the fact that you wanted to harm my baby is unforgivable. It turns out the stuff from the past that she mentioned before was that my mom harmed her to destroy her voice. So that's why dad didn't let me sing, for fear that it would cause Emma pain. Suddenly mom burst out laughing. <laughs> I don't need your pity. You were so lucky to have such a beautiful voice and a wonderful man by your side. And even now, you're still trying to take the life that should have been mine. Megan, give it up already. You need to stop this. Mom was about to say something, but I interrupted her. Mom, please just go. I'm so ashamed to have a mother like you. Then I burst into tears. She got up and left, without even so much as a glance back at us. Emma took me into her arms. I was afraid that you would be disappointed. That's why I hid everything from you. I'm sorry for treating you so badly. She gently patted my head, and I felt like I was back in my childhood, where she'd held me and sang lullabies. It was so comforting. Finally, peace has returned to my family. I'm so fortunate to have Emma as a stepmom. And pretty soon, my little bro or sis will be here. And I can't wait. been trying to find you at school today. I have big news, and it's bad. Real bad! Don't leave me hanging! Mom says we're defo moving to California by the end of the month! What? No way! That's a two-day drive from here! Yeah, I know! But Mom's marrying David. The same David that's scared of spiders, cockroaches, and everything? Yeah. That guy. He's been trying to get her attention for ages. Sending her flowers, playing the guitar on her porch. Then last week, he even climbed up the oak tree so he could hand her flowers through the bedroom window. Okay, that's kind of creepy. Ew. Tell me about it. But you know, the worst part is, I have to transfer to another school. No, no, no. Lisa couldn't move away. Who would I sit with at lunch? Who would I watch corny movies with? Ugh, we've been besties for years. We couldn't just be separated like this. No one would ever understand me like she did. We were like two halves of a whole. Her dad had passed away, so she only had her mom, while I only had my dad. And yep, that's my amazing dad. It's been just me and him for the past 10 years. 
I still remember that afternoon when my mom took her suitcase and left with another man. After that, me and dad moved back here, to our hometown, New Hampshire. It's only when I got a little older that I found out mom and her lover scammed dad out of everything. So dad's been working his butt off to open his own repair garage to provide for us both ever since. It isn't fair. My dad's a hero, and he deserves to be with a better woman. Hold on. Yes, he deserves a better one. And who wouldn't be better than Lisa's mom? I needed to tell Lisa about my plan right now. So I immediately ran to my room and phoned her. Girl, I have the most genius plan ever to keep you and your mom here with me. Please, I'm all ears. Anything. I really don't want to move to Cali. Okay, listen. Let's set your mom up with my dad. He's a good guy. And that means we'll be sisters. We both squealed excitedly. Lisa always wanted to have a dad. A nice one. Not that David creep. Ugh. I could see the envy in her eyes when I spoke about the funny pranks I played on my dad. Well, in contrast, my heart ached whenever she told me about the girly pamper days she had with her mom. <sighs> okay, first, research is important. We spent all night looking up their horoscopes, name astrology calculator, and even physiognomy. Whoa, they're a 98% match! But hey, nothing is perfect, right? Me and Lisa would make up for the missing 2%. The next day, we were both zombies due to the lack of sleep. But at least a proper plan had been set. I told Lisa to tell her mom, Mary, to come around on Saturday for my birthday. Um, yeah, it's not actually my birthday. But she's a presenter for a big news channel, so she's super busy. We needed to make up some special occasion so she couldn't say no. Then I told my dad to prepare his signature dish to welcome my special guests. There's no way Mary could resist. That day, I was helping dad with the ingredients when I heard the doorbell. I opened the door to see Lisa standing there with a pink frosted birthday cake. And by her side was her mom. Happy birthday, sweetie. This one's for you. Oh, something smells good. Hmm, and so familiar. She continued. Hello? Mary? Jack? Why are you here? For Aaron's birthday. And you? I'm her father. And FYI, today isn't her birthday. Yeah, jerk. Mary said under her breath while rolling her eyes. Excuse me? You dumped me for no reason, so what's that attitude? Oh, really? For no reason? My eyes darted from Dad to Mary. Huh? Why were they yelling at each other? This was very confusing, but I could guess that they used to date? OMG, what a small world! Okay, whatever, because it's lunchtime now. And wow, Dad's legendary meatloaf smelled amazeballs. We sat down. And Mary glared at Dad as she took a bite of food. Then she blurted out, Oh, wow. I guess some things never change, huh? Your food is still super salty. Oh, really? But as I recall, someone still asked for seconds. Unbelievable. Excuse me, but do you know each other? Lisa innocently interrupted. There was an awkward silence. Then Dad said, Yeah, we do. But this is the first time I've seen Mary since we broke up, right after I visited her studio for the first time. Mary looked flustered as she replied, Lisa, you shouldn't have tricked me into coming here. Finish your food, then we're leaving. On hearing this, Dad ordered Lisa and me up to my room so he could talk to Mary in private. Only, we hid behind the couch and listened in. Turns out, on that day... Mary took my dad to the studio to watch her first filming as a news presenter. After that, she'd passed by the waiting room and overheard dad talking to someone. I clearly heard that person ask you how I looked, and you said I was still the same old Mary. Do you have any idea that I spent two hours in makeup and was excited to show you? Dad tried to chime in, but Mary wouldn't give him a sec. We're still... Later, you even told them you were over the moon I wouldn't be your girlfriend for much longer. Thus, to intercept that, I had to break up with you first. Oh, my. So my dad was a playboy or something? 
Lisa and I swapped confused looks, then continued watching the show. My dad was dumbfounded, and then he said in a helpless voice, Oh, Mary, things were not like that. I said that you look the same because you're always as beautiful as the day I met you. And about the other thing... Yeah? Um, I prepared a ring to propose to you so you no longer be my girlfriend, but my wife. What? So they broke up because of an absurd misunderstanding and lost contact since then. Jeez, I thought adults were meant to know what they were doing. It sure didn't seem like it at times. Mary gave Dad an awkward smile, and they said that they could be friends. Then she told him about David and how she was marrying him on the 22nd of December. No! We couldn't let this happen. There had to be another way of getting them together. But that road was full of thorns and spikes, especially when Dad dropped a bombshell. His new girlfriend, Lucy! A few days later, when I was working on my art project, Dad walked into the room with her. Excuse me? She was wearing this super tight bodycon dress and had at least seven layers of makeup on. Ugh. Then she even dared to pick up the photo of me with Mom and smirked. Oh, how... nice. I rushed over to her, snatched it out of her hands and shouted, Keep off my things! I don't like you! She immediately glared at me. But then seeing Dad coming down from upstairs, she suddenly smiled and hugged me while whispering in my ear, You don't, but you have to. Jeez, what a poisonous snake! But worse, when she left, Dad had this dumb grin on his face, and then he actually asked if I wanted her to be my new mom! Oh no, she'd hypnotized him for sure! In a rush, I called Lisa to tell her about it. She came up with the idea of asking her mom to join us at the Christmas market this week. Bummer. She refused. Apparently she had too much wedding planning to do. Ugh. And if you're thinking it couldn't get worse, then Dad invited Lucy along. So, Lisa asked her mom to let her stay with me for a few days, so we could teach this Lucy some lessons. May the pranking commence. That morning... Lucy showed up in this fancy light blue dress and ordered Dad to get her a chocolate-covered waffle. What a shame. I accidentally knocked it all over her outfit. Oops! Then a fake fly somehow fell into her hot chocolate. Her eyes almost bulged out of her head when she drank that. <laughs> but she just gave us a cunning smirk, then grabbed Dad's arm and cuddled close to him. Unbelievable! But you know... Diamond cuts diamond. When Dad went to the restroom, with sparkling eyes, I said, Lucy, I really admire a nice person like you. My dad's only a mechanic with $1,500 a month, but you still love him. Um, so this isn't true. He ran his own business. But anyway... No way! He looks rich, though. Oh, he probably was just desperate to catch your attention. He bragged a little bit. And you're proud of that? That's not funny, sweetie. I am out of your dad's league. There's no way I'm putting up with a brat like you for such a poor man. Right at that moment, my dad returned and, no surprises, they broke up. Now she was out of the picture, dad was free to win Mary over, right? We three went home, and I noticed that dad was acting weird. He kept on pacing by the door. Then, when Mary arrived to pick Lisa up, he leapt to open it and blurted out to her, Have you thought any more about... us? She didn't say anything, but I noticed them exchanging these sorry looks. Their love for each other was so obviously real, as they knew each other since they had nothing. <sighs> Yet they weren't doing anything about it. It was already December 20th, meaning there were only two days left till the wedding day. I couldn't let our plan fail like this. I immediately grabbed my phone to call Lisa, but the ringing was next to me. She left her phone at my house. Dang! Then the next morning, I walked by her house to go to school as usual, but no one was home, and she wasn't at school either. Oh my, had they moved to David's already? I told Dad this right away when I got home. 
He thought for a second and asked me to get in the car ASAP to go to California. So our bumper two-day road trip began. When we reached the wedding venue, it was empty. Oh no, we were too late. Dad looked devastated. So I put my arm around him and started to lead him out of there. But then the receptionist appeared and said, Oh, didn't they let you know either? The wedding's been canceled. Dad's face lit up, and we both raced over to the car and started the long drive back. Oh, it felt like ages in the car, and now it was just two hours until Christmas Eve. The roads were full of beautiful Christmas decorations. I looked through the windows and saw people gathering with their families, while Dad and I were driving nonstop. How sad. We drove straight to Lisa and Mary's, but they were out. So we sat in the freezing cold on their doorstep and waited. Dad dozed off, his head resting on my shoulder. Bless. Then I saw them walking towards us. Oh man, you should have seen their shocked faces. <laughs> I shook Dad awake and he looked over at Mary. She dropped her bags and looked at us astonished. Then Lisa told us the whole story. Turns out, on the way to California, they met two amateur robbers who forced them to get out of the car. Mary immediately pounded them with her handbag, while David ran off and hid behind a tree with Lisa. When the robbers scampered off, Mary told David everything from the bottom of her heart, that although David was wealthy, that was not what she wanted. Instead, she just needed a man who could support and protect her. She'd been flattered by his gestures of love, touched by his persistence, and thought that love could be cultivated. But things weren't as simple as that. So they broke up, and the wedding was cancelled. Dad and I were stunned. Then, with eyes prickled with tears, my dad said, Mary, I'm sorry for letting you go, but it's not too late, is it? Right after, he pulled the old ring from that day out of his pocket and got down on one knee and said, Mary, will you marry me? She cried out, Yes! Both Lisa and I were bursting with happiness. So now we both have a mom and a dad, and we're pretty much sisters. Yay! This is the warmest Christmas ever. I was on my way to Julia's house for a study sesh, when out of nowhere, I found myself flying onto the ground. I was so stunned, I didn't even see the ball that had hit me, or the fact there was a cute guy rushing over to check if I was okay. He helped me up and apologized. Then he pulled a band-aid out of his bag. Oh my, who is he? I'd scraped my hand pretty badly, but I almost didn't mind because now I was face to face with a gorgeous guy. In fact, I was so busy staring at him and blushing that I didn't even notice Julia marching towards us. Um, what are you two doing? Turns out the cute guy was Callum, Julia's boyfriend. Ugh, Julia. Of course, every nice thing is always hers. I'm Jenny, by the way, and that lucky girl is Julia. She's the daughter of the richest guy in town, Mr. Walsh. We're supposed to be friends, but we honestly have nothing in common. I mean, my family is pretty poor. It's not our fault, though. My dad sadly passed away, and so it's just me and my mom trying to make ends meet. Julia, on the other hand, has a silver spoon shoved down her throat. But fate still brought us together. I know it's kind of wrong, but that night I couldn't stop thinking about Callum. He now, in fact, gave me motivation for the next study session with bossy Julia, as maybe he would be there again. I even put on makeup, and skipping on the way to her house the next day. But, well, it was all for nothing, because Callum was nowhere to be seen. Instead, I had to sit and listen to Julia go on and on about her trip to Paris. I pretended that I was okay, but actually, I always dreamed of visiting the city of light and gazing up at the Eiffel Tower ever since watching Emily in Paris. Dream on, Jenny. Anyway, Julia was incessant. She loved making me look like a fool, and even said, Aw, poor Jenny. Maybe one day you'll get to go to Paris. But until then, you can just look at all my photos. Honestly, why was she so cruel to me? Last year around my birthday, she'd even shown me a fashion magazine 
and asked me which dress I liked best. I thought she was buying gifts for me, but instead, she showed up at my party in the exact dress I pointed out. I couldn't believe it. She just winked at me and laughed, and I seriously wanted to scream at her. Anyway, after looking at about one billion Paris pics, Mr. Walsh appeared. He looked happy to see us sitting so close and studying together. If only he knew the truth. But I had to pretend I had a lot of fun with Julia and helping her study, at least for his sake. Mr. Walsh was a good friend of our family, and ever since my dad passed away, he'd been looking out for me, and was even paying my school fees. I couldn't let him down. But you know what? I actually started to get excited to go over to Julia's now, as the thought of bumping into Callum again gave me butterflies. I even got myself a new hairstyle but he was never there, and I always left feeling disappointed. Then one time, after school, it started to rain dogs and cats, and I had to run for it. Then suddenly, I felt an umbrella over my head. Guess what? It was Callum coming to the rescue. It was like something out of a romantic movie. He even offered me a lift home. My heart was racing so hard, I was afraid he'd hear it. I just sat there in silence, dripping rain all over his clean car. I even caught him looking over at me a few times, and my heart felt like it was going to leap out of my chest. He pulled up at my house, so I was about to get out when he touched my arm and said, Can I get your number? I was confused. I mean, wasn't he Julia's boyfriend? He then explained that he was just hired to be her fake boyfriend so that all the flirty boys would get out of her way. Wow, I couldn't believe it. He asked me to keep it a secret as Julia would end us both if this story got out. Okay, it all made sense now. That's why he never came over to her house. I felt so happy. Over the next few days, Callum and I chatted a lot on the phone. And then eventually, he asked me out on a date. We went to the fun fair, and right away he held my hand. It made me feel so special, and I never wanted him to let go. We were having so much fun, then a familiar voice pierced the air. Well, well, well. Isn't that my dear friend, Jenny? I felt dread rush through my whole body. We turned around, and there was Julia and her girl gang all standing there with their arms crossed. Callum dropped my hand and rushed to Julia's side. It was all her, babe. You've got to see the messages she sent. She's been flirting with me for weeks. It's pathetic. Whoa, was he for real? A second ago, he was about to lean in for a kiss. And now he was bad-mouthing me? How could he be so two-faced? I tried to explain to Julia, but she wouldn't listen. She just called me a traitor in front of everyone and told all her friends to lock up their boyfriends in case I try it on with one of theirs next. I was devastated. Everyone was staring at me and judging me. Ugh, if only I could vanish into thin air right now. And as I was thinking about where I could escape to, a guy appeared, grabbed my wrist, and pulled me away. It was Stefan, the guy who lived across the road from me. I didn't understand why he helped me, but I was so grateful that he did. He walked me home and tried to cheer me up by saying how his mom used to love our bakery so much, and that the carrot cake my mom made was his mom's fave. This made me smile, thinking back on all those happy times in our family bakery. When my dad had died, we'd had to sell it to pay off some debt, and life had become quite difficult. Luckily, Mr. Walsh was helping out, but after what just happened with Julia, I wasn't sure I'd be able to face him. The next day at school, everyone was staring at me. I couldn't even find a place to sit at lunch. What had I done? I'd ruined everything. And then it got worse. My phone beeped. It was Mr. Walsh. He said he was so disappointed in me and that I no longer needed to come and tutor his daughter. I wanted to cry, and at the same time, I felt so much relief. But then I read on, and he said, I'm sorry, but I can't keep my promise anymore. I'll continue to subsidize your school fees, but you'll have to figure something out for college. Good luck. My heart plummeted. Not only had I been shunned by everyone at school and backstabbed by Callum, but now the door to college was being slammed in my face, too. What would I do? My life was over. I felt so sick. I just walked out of the canteen and went home. I didn't dare go to school over the next few days. I was miserable. And just when I'd given up all hope, there was a knock at my door. It was Callum. What was he doing here? He said he was sorry for what had happened and that he missed me so much. Then he asked me if I'd be interested in being his secret girlfriend. What in the world? I was so angry, I wanted to slam the door in his face. 
but he was fast enough to catch my hand, which took me aback. At that exact moment, Stefan happened to walk past. Seeing me standing there with Callum, his face changed and he immediately walked away. Oh, no. I definitely couldn't let him misunderstand anything about me anymore. He's the only friend I had left. I yanked my arm away from Callum and chased after Stefan. I finally caught up with him and blurted out how I've been feeling like the whole world was against me and that I didn't know what to do. He told me to calm down, then we went to sit on a bench in the park, as he let me confide everything in him. By the time I finished talking, I was on the verge of tears. Then he said, Listen, Jenny, you're better than this. Don't dim to fit in with those people at your school. Good people will see you for the real you. You're strong, and you can get through anything. I know you can. He was right. I was better than this. I didn't need to sink as low as Julia and her friends, and I certainly didn't need to rely on Mr. Walsh's money. I'd figure this out by myself, like I always did. So I applied for a part-time job at a coffee shop. Earning my own money felt so good. Suddenly I felt free, and I knew everything was going to be okay. But then one day when I was working, Julia and her gang came in. They still weren't over what happened, and in front of everyone, they brought up what I'd done to humiliate me. And they even recorded it, and I couldn't stop shaking. This was too much. That's when I threw a cup of coffee all over Julia and ran out of there. Julia shouted after me that she was going to tell my mom everything I'd done. Without a doubt, Julia really did it. She even sent my mom photos of me and Callum at the fair. And well, my mom didn't take it well. I rushed home to try and explain after mom yelled at me over the phone. But then I couldn't find mom anywhere. I called her phone and a man answered. He said my mom was in a hospital after she fainted? Oh dear good God! I got to the hospital immediately and found out that she had collapsed from shock. But thankfully she was okay. She had to stay in the rest of the day to be monitored. So I went to get us both a cup of coffee. That's when I saw him. Callum. He was in the ward next door sitting with some girl. I almost dropped the coffee out of shock. They looked close. I waited until he'd left, and then I went to ask the girl if Callum was her boyfriend. Well, turns out, they'd been dating for two years already. So he was triple cheating? The girl deserved to know the truth, so I took a deep breath and told her everything. She was so upset. We decided to get our own back. So the girl called Callum and asked him to come back. As soon as he arrived, we confronted him and got the truth once and for all. He was never Julia's real boyfriend. In fact, here's the shocking part. He was hired by Julia to pretend to date me and ruin my life. Apparently, she was jealous of how much attention her dad gave me since my dad had died, and that her dad constantly compared her to me. He kept apologizing to his girlfriend, saying how much he loved her, and that he only agreed to help Julia so that he could earn some money to help pay for her medical bills. I was stunned. Callum was so apologetic and said he'd come clean about everything. He posted it on the school forum to clear my name and to everyone to see the ugly truth about Julia. And of course, when Mr. Walsh saw it, he made her come and apologize to me. And he also apologized himself and offered to pay my college fees again. Do you think I accepted his offer? Of course not. I was standing on my own feet now, and there was no going back. I didn't need anyone's help. So you might be wondering how I could afford college. Surely not on my coffee shop salary, right? Well, after graduating high school, I realized how much I missed the bakery. That was where I truly felt happy. So I decided to study to become a pastry chef, and now my mom and I have opened a new bakery. I've never been happier, and there's one last thing I want to share. Oh, in fact, here he is. Hey, Stefan, I've made your mom's fave. Let's go surprise her. I couldn't stop smiling as Stefan took the carrot cake, kissed my cheek, and we headed for his car. Life is so much more simple now, and sweet, and I love it. Rules, rules, rules. Moms sure do love dishing them out, don't they? I'm Nicole, by the way. And you see, my parents divorced when I was eight, so since then, it's just been me and mom. Mom laid down a bunch of boring rules for me, but I hate following them. I'm 18, and I should be out having fun, right? To me, rules were made to be broken anyway. And trust me, I broke them. Only, this led to my whole life changing. 
One day, I had an important math test, but I hate math. So I skipped school and went to the movies with my friends instead. I mean, hello? The last Avengers movie had just come out. No way was I missing it and getting spoilers. Maybe mom would give me a detention for a few weeks, but it's no big deal, right? I arrived home to find mom waiting for me. She glared at me and said, Nicole, I received an interesting phone call from the school. It turns out you haven't been there all day. So, where have you been? Oh no, busted! I just shrugged and replied, Out! It's those friends of yours, isn't it? They are a bad influence. I walked off to my room. Nicole, come back here and talk! She shouted after me, but I ignored her. Then she yelled out, I can't stand you and your childish attitude anymore. You're going to live with your dad. What? She was kicking me out. Wow, I didn't expect her to do that. Whatever. I was sick of being moaned at all the time. Surely dad would be far more understanding. I hadn't seen dad all that much. In fact, the last time was, um, I think it was my 16th birthday. He was a busy man, as he's the principal at this snooty boy school. And mom wasn't kidding. She called him up, and that evening, he showed up and loaded my stuff into the trunk of his car. It felt super awkward. I had no idea what to say to him. Then, about an hour into the seriously tedious journey, he said, I completed all the admission procedures for you, so you can start learning in my school tomorrow. What? It was an all-boys school, and I was a girl. Besides, no way was I studying somewhere where my dad was the principal. Panicked, I asked, but dad, isn't it an all-boys school? He said, it used to be, but of late... We've let a few female students in. I can't go there. You're the principal. It'll be so embarrassing. No way. I'll go to another school or something. He gave me a strict look and said, Mom told me all about your behavior in your old school and it's unacceptable. So, you'll be learning at my school so I can keep an eye on you. This is not up for debate. OMG, I can't believe it. He was much stricter than Mom. So reluctantly, I muttered out, Fine, but only if you promise not to tell anyone I'm your daughter. He nodded and said, Okay, if that's what you want. The school was like something out of one of those weird movies. You know, where the characters think they're safe, but then start disappearing one by one? For starters, it was situated on a hill, miles from anything else. Inside, well, it was so masculine browns and grays, and I didn't see one picture in the entire building. The only female thing in the whole place was the girls' restroom. We had to share everything else with the boys. Talk about an inconvenience. The uniform was the same for boys and girls. An oversized shirt and baggy pants and these gross flat shoes. Yuck! During P.E., girls were forced to do the same workout as the boys. Bench presses, push-ups, and playing soccer is not my idea of fun. Ugh! And there wasn't even a cheerleading squad. Then, there were all these extra dumb rules for the girls, like only uniforms are allowed at school. No skirt, no dress, not even jeans. Do the top button of your shirt up. Tie your hair up into this ugly bun. No flirting with the boys. Yep, that was actually a rule. Can you believe this place? I didn't know whether this was a high school or a prison. I thought this was bad, but I soon realized this school had a major problem. Maybe it's because this school was originally boys only, but man, this place didn't appreciate girls at all. Once in a history class, the teacher asked us what year Abraham Lincoln became president. Easy. But before I could even raise my hand, she continued, This question seemed too hard for girls. So do any of the boys know the answer? What? How could she say that? What was with her male chauvinist attitude? This put me in a bad mood. So during dinner, I decided to moan to dad about it. He needed to know how ridiculous his school was. So I told him how I hated his dumb rules and how sexist the teachers were. 
He glared at me and told me that there weren't enough girls at the school to warrant a separate uniform. Moreover, if girls dressed up, it would only cause distractions for the boys. As for the history teacher, it was just because boys often have larger knowledge than girls on this matter, so maybe she just didn't want to embarrass the girls in case they couldn't give out the right answer. Ha! Huh, what kind of argument was this? It wasn't the olden days. Jeez, these oldies needed to get with the decade. Okay, fine. I'll prove to the whole school and all the teachers that there weren't only boys here. The next day, I gathered all the girls from my class. Um, in fact, there were only two of them, Angela and Carly, and we met up in the only girly place, the girls' restroom. Then I told them, Hey girls, welcome to our club, The Doll. I think it's about time we fought for our rights and presence in this school. As girls matter too, right? At first, they both seemed worried. I get it, they didn't want to get in trouble. But I soon managed to convince them that it'd be fine. Fun, even. So they came around and agreed. First up, it was time to do something about this awful uniform. We tied up our shirts to expose our waists, and I helped the others put subtle makeup on, so our skin looked like it had a natural glow to it. Then, we all put glittery hair accessories and colorful scrunchies in our hair to jazz up our updos. Carly looked in the mirror and said, Okay, maybe our uniform isn't so bad. And we all burst out laughing. Now, it was time to make an entrance. We all walked along the corridor together. All the boys and girls turned around to look at us with admiring eyes and open mouths. One boy even dropped his stack of books on the floor and another one walked into his locker. Ha! The charm of girls was absolutely irresistible, right? Soon, we became a popular group around the school. The boys wanted to talk to us, and girls from other classes also joined our group, and I showed them how to style up their uniforms. It's great, right? Yep. There's a problem. The teachers were old fogies who didn't appreciate style. One day, before class, one teacher came up to me and my friends and accused us of ruining the dignity of the uniform and of exerting negative influences on other students. So I told her, we aren't violating any of the school's previous rules. We wear the uniform, we keep our top button done up, and we have the regulation hairstyle. Dressing up is a girl's prerogative. Besides, if boys are distracted, it's their fault, not ours. So you can't blame us for that. After that, I seemed to become a thorn in the side of all the teachers. In every subject, I would always be asked to answer the most difficult questions. And, of course, I didn't know the right answer. I mean, nobody knew it. And then they would give me a gloating look. Ugh, how childish they were. Another time, I was in a lunch queue, and when it was my turn, I chose barbecue chicken drumsticks, as they're my favorite. However, to my surprise, the canteen service said there was no chicken left, then put this weird oatmeal slop on my plate. Ew! I could see there were loads of chicken left, so why was she being so unreasonable? I skipped the gross slop, so as soon as I got home from school, I was so hungry, so I made myself a huge bowl of noodles. Dad saw me devouring the food, then smiled and asked, Has causing trouble at school all day made you that hungry? In between my mouthfuls of food, I told him what had happened with the teacher, and in the canteen. He just smiled and said it was because I was too stubborn. What kind of an excuse was that? I mean, when was starving students a good idea? The next morning, I drowsily walked into class and sat down at my desk. That's when I realized... I'd forgotten my phone. Well, this totally sucked, so I moaned to Angela. These teachers make my life a misery, and now I don't even have my phone. Today is going to be a long one. Suddenly, someone knocked on my desk. I looked up and saw my dad, aka the principal, standing there in front of me. I was so surprised that before I could say anything, he said, Hey, Cupcake, you left your phone at home. Oh, and I brought you breakfast, as you know how grumpy you get when you're hungry. Then he put my phone and a sandwich on my desk, stroked my hair, then left. What was he doing? Did he forget his promise? Needless to say, my classmates looked shocked. Angela stared at me and said, Huh? 
the principal is your dad? Unbelievable! Why didn't you tell us? I sat there open-mouthed. This was the most awkward thing ever. Thanks a lot, Dad. But little did I know, that was just the start of a new chapter of craziness. Things were about to get even worse. And oh boy, you wouldn't want to miss out on that. I'm so nervous. You see, today is my first day of school ever. That's right. I'm Heather, I'm 15 years old, and I've never stepped foot inside of a school before. This is because my dad's a scientist and my mom's a writer, so they really cared about my education and worried that the elementary and middle schools in our town wouldn't be good enough, so my mom homeschooled me. Honestly, it was great. I really enjoyed learning about all kinds of different topics, especially literature. But then when I watch TV shows about high schools like The Kissing Booth or High School Musical, I felt a pang in my chest. I was missing out on so many things like having friends and talking to boys. I desperately wanted what those girls on TV had. So I begged my mom to let me go to high school. It took a lot of persuading and fake tears, but she agreed eventually. I was so excited. Finally. I'd get to experience school firsthand instead of living it vicariously through my favorite TV characters. Oh my god, what should I wear? What would I talk about? How would I make friends? This was actually happening! I could barely sleep the night before, and instead, I took the whole night to prepare myself. This was an important milestone in my life. So, here I am, walking down the street to the bus station. Whoa, I've never seen so many people my age before. This is like a dream come true. I spotted an empty seat next to this girl, so I walked over with a smile. Excuse me, can I sit here? The girl looked me up and down, rolled her eyes, then put her bag on that seat. Sorry, it's already taken. Okay, that's fine. I'll sit alone in the back then, no problem. The girl must have gotten up on the wrong side of the bed or something. But, well, turned out it wasn't just the girl on the bus who'd gotten out of bed the wrong way. Because as soon as Mrs. Hickson, my English lit teacher, introduced me to everybody in class, I could see that everyone was giving me weird looks too. Were they making fun of me? But why? Did I have jam on my face? Mrs. Hickson showed me to my seat and the class began. By now, you've all had plenty of time to finish reading The Great Gatsby. Aw, I adore that novel. Throughout the novel, Fitzgerald continuously references a green light that Gatsby keeps on reaching for. Can anyone tell me what the green light symbolizes? I looked around, expecting to see everybody raise their hand. But to my shock, they were all staring down at their desks to avoid eye contact with Mrs. Hickson. Huh? But why? This was so easy! Suddenly, Mrs. Hickson said, No one, huh? Well, how about you, Kelly? Everybody turned and looked at a girl who was adjusting her fake eyelashes in her compact mirror. Kelly continued fiddling with her eyelashes as she replied, Um, doesn't a traffic light have a green light? So, duh, it means that he can cross the street. What? I burst out laughing, but then everyone turned to look at me. Oh, snap. Why was I the only one laughing? I mean, her answer was totally hilarious. Mrs. Hickson walked towards me. Oh, no. Was I in trouble? Heather appears to be the only one here who understands why Kelly's answer was ridiculous. Can you explain this to your classmates? Um, the color green in itself illustrates the idea of greed and money being a symbol of Gatsby's desire for Daisy. Gatsby already has everything anyone could dream for, but still, he is chasing after this light, or in other words, chasing after the love of his life, Daisy. Mrs. Hickson gave me a satisfied smile, patted me on the shoulder, and then she said, That's correct. Very good, Heather. Suddenly, someone coughed out the word, Nerd! Everybody started to laugh. Seriously? 
How could they laugh at this, but not Kelly's foolish answer? Quiet! Mrs. Hickson then turned to Kelly and said, Perhaps if you used your eyes to actually read a book, instead of only using them to wear fake eyelashes, then Heather here wouldn't need to help you. Kelly glanced over at me, so I smiled at her. But, huh? Why was she giving me a dagger look? Did I do something wrong? After class was over, I was sticking cute pictures in my locker when Kelly and her two friends, Samantha and Brittany, appeared next to me. Heather, right? Yeah, that's right. Oh my god, your sweater is... Oh, do you like it? My mom... So ugly. Why are you even wearing one? It's not even cold. Is your mirror busted or something? Why else would you choose to wear such an awful outfit? Then the three of them started to laugh. What do you mean? I dress just like Jess in New Girl. She looks amazing, doesn't she? This made them laugh even louder. While I was still feeling confused about what just happened, a girl named Taylor walked over. Hi, I overheard what you were talking about. Actually, New Girl ended a few years back, so her style is kinda outdated. Try watching Emily in Paris. That's the trend nowadays. Oh god, I didn't think of that. No wonder the girl on the bus. Oh wait, no wonder everyone at school was giving me awkward looks. They must be thinking I came from the past or something. And you should be careful. Kelly and her gang like to tease others, and I think you're their new target. Oh, so Kelly's stare earlier in class wasn't just a regular stare. But so what? Thanks, but I'm not afraid of them. I know this type of mean girl. They're all bark and no bite. So that night, I binge-watched Emily in Paris. It's Trey chic. I studied the fashion style and mixed up some outfits. I looked at myself in the mirror and, oh my, I really did look different. The next day at school, no one was giving me funny looks. How about that? Taylor's advice was really helpful. By the end of the first week, I'd established myself as most of the teacher's favorite student. It sounded great, right? But trust me, it wasn't. Every time a teacher praised me, Kelly and her friends gave me dirty looks. <sighs> then I found a note stuck to my locker that said, You weedo. Right at that moment, Kelly and her friends walked past me giggling. In anger, I ripped off the note and told them, when you're leaving mean comments at my locker, at least write them correctly. Weirdo is missing an R. They immediately stopped laughing and rushed off so that nobody knew it was them. Man, they were so annoying. High school wasn't turning out how I expected it to be. I thought I would be one of the cool kids, not the one being teased. Ugh. Then word got out that I used to be homeschooled. So Kelly began making jokes like, did your parents make you stay at home because you're a freak? Well, at least thanks to homeschooling, I don't come up with dumb answers in lit class. I snapped back. She stopped laughing and gave me this dumbfounded look. After that, they still carried on with their immature jokes at every given opportunity, but I tried my best to ignore them. But one day, they took it too far. I came to class and saw a big character drawing on the blackboard. It was me! Oh my god, Heather, your portrait looks amazing! <laughs> and the whole class burst out laughing. Ugh, how dare she! You messed with the wrong girl this time, Kelly! That afternoon, I went home and was persistent to find a way to get payback on the mean girls. Bingo! I took out my laptop and began frantically working. After just one night, I managed to hack all their social media accounts including their iCloud, and found a lot of good stuff. So the next time they mess with me, I'll be prepared. And it didn't take long until Kelly's friends stopped me in the hallway again. Ugh, could your skirt be any longer? Yeah, your grandma called. She wants her clothes back. Suddenly, everyone gathered around us to see what was going on. Good timing. Now we had an audience. Let's give the mean girls a taste of their own medicine. Beautiful hair, Samantha. Tell me, how often do you have to dye it so that nobody knows you're actually a redhead? W what did you say? Oh, and Brittany? Nice nose job. What? 
Everybody shockingly turned to look at Samantha's beautiful blonde hair and Brittany's nose. <laughs> How? Brittany stuttered out before she grabbed Samantha's arm and they fled the scene. Yep, I've learned all about their embarrassing past through the pictures I've hacked last night. After that, Samantha and Brittany didn't dare to bother me, but the three of them were still teasing other people. Then, I couldn't hold my frustration anymore when I saw them making fun of Taylor. Hey, leave her alone! Kelly turned around smirking. Didn't your parents teach you that it's rude to interrupt people when they're talking? Or do they have weird opinions on that, too? Oh, so that's how she wants to do it. Fine by me. Bring it on. Well, talking of parents, how are your parents doing, Kelly? Oh, wait, aren't they getting divorced? Kelly's grin immediately disappeared and was replaced with a look of complete and utter dread. Then she just ran away without saying anything leaving her friends shocked as well. That's right. I saw a really long private post about her parents getting divorced on Facebook. That must be her way to express her thoughts. But her bad, it kind of backfired. After the mean girls left, Taylor thanked me, and some of the other students gathered around me and praised me for standing up against Kelly and her clique. From then on, the mean girls avoided me like the plague. <laughs> and just like that, I went from the nerdy homeschooled girl to the cool, popular girl who had the guts to stand up against the mean girls. It felt incredible. Then one day, I went to the bathroom during a class, and I heard someone in the stall, crying. She was talking on the phone. Please, Mom, don't get divorced. Can't you and Dad try to make it work? For me? Oh, man. Could it be Kelly? As I was washing my hands, the stall door opened, and just as I thought, a red-eyed Kelly walked out. As soon as she saw me, she wiped away her tears and gave me a dirty glare. At that moment, I didn't feel good. I felt the complete opposite. I never realized that it was so hard for her. Making her feel bad didn't make me feel good. It made me feel bad, too. Kelly... I'm sorry about your parents. But she just snorted, then went to leave. I grabbed her arm. Please, Kelly. I didn't mean to hurt you. Kelly looked me in the eyes and said, But you did! I know. I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking straight. I kept apologizing to her, and after a while she eventually said, <sighs> Well... I suppose I was kind of mean to you, too. We ended up talking, and she told me that she teased people to make her feel better about her family situation, which she was struggling to deal with. So I opened up to her about how nervous I was about starting school. We actually had a great talk, and the air was cleared between us. So, you see, from that moment on, things between me and the mean girls were great. Oh, wait... They aren't the mean girls anymore, just simply Kelly, Samantha, and Brittany. <laughs> they learned that their actions towards me and other students weren't cool, and they finally understood how it felt like being laughed at, so they don't do it to anyone else anymore. So, in the end, high school turned out to be pretty amazing, just like I imagined it to be, but even better! <laughs> On my very first day of high school, I showed up in my extreme goth girl attire as every other day. I felt good, but unfortunately, the teacher didn't appreciate my look as she gave me this disgusted stare and blurted out, How peculiar. Excuse me? So how do you define normal? How come being your true self is abnormal, but it's totally fine to live a fake, boring life just to fit into this judgmental society? The whole class gasped and stared at me. As for the teacher, I'd rendered her speechless. I guess word got around, as at recess this red-haired goth boy smiled at me and said, Hey, it's Miranda, right? Do you want to join my group? Well, no need to ask twice. This guy was cute. And everyone in this group was goth, too. This was where I belonged. They share my views on how the media's unattainable standards of beauty are fake, 
and how pathetic everyone is for striving to look like mass-produced dolls. Ugh. I like them. Actually, I didn't have many friends. You see, as soon as I discovered my true identity at 13 and started dressing this way, my old friends ditched me. People are always so quick to judge and don't gel well with others that are different. It's so lame. But whatever. Those bland blenders could never understand my effort to stand out and be true to myself. The only girl who stuck around was Isabel. She's been my best friend since we were six. And my black lipstick and chokers didn't scare her off. My parents just thought I was going through a rebellious phase. So they let me do what I wanted. Only my older sister Harper was bitter about it. Oh, please! Biologically and technically, you are not a goth. You're an American who likes the gothic style. Ha! <laughs> Jealous much? You see, Harper was your standard girl-next-door type. Just like everybody else. Yawn. Whatever. As it's her business. I don't care. But please don't force me to be like her. Ugh! Okay, back to school things. From that day onward, I joined the goths. They were all very cool. Especially the red-haired guy, Ralph. The more time I spent with him, the more I knew we were made for each other. So, one time, I confided in Isabel about my feelings for him and told her I was planning to ask him to be my boyfriend. Are you sure? It's just you haven't known him long and you don't know how he feels about you. Oh, bless. Isabel was being her usual sweet, caring, worried self. But come on, this was a sure bet. It's okay, Izzy. I'm the coolest one, not only in my group, but also in this school. There's no way he can turn me down. No. Ralph's answer cut right through me without any hesitation. I haven't even finished my love confession. Ouch. Seeing me dead still and mouth wide open, Ralph continued, Look, Miranda, your style is so cool, and I know you're one of us, but honestly, whenever I talk to you, I think it's just so tasteless. Besides, I'm already dating Aaron, so we should just be friends. Tasteless? What did he mean, tasteless? And OMG, Aaron? Unbelievable. Her goth makeup and outfits were no way near as good as mine. What did she have that I didn't? Furious, I stomped home, rushed to my room, and screamed into my pillow. On hearing this, Harper hurried in and asked me what was up. I needed to talk to someone, so I blurted it all out to her. Wow, she raised her eyebrows. Rude. Still, she paused, scratching her chin. Uh-oh. I know she always does that thing whenever she's about to say something mean. You know, that Ralph guy does have a point. I mean, instead of spending three hours a day applying endless layers of makeup, you could use that time to learn how to be less boring. She shrugged. What? Shut up! Get out of my room! I furiously pushed her out and slammed the door. But, come to think of it, what if the other kid stopped being friends with me? And not because of my look, but due to my tastelessness. Nah, that can't be the case. Harper was just being her usual ridiculous self. So I stayed loyal to myself throughout high school and continued to live life my way. No one can make me change my mind, ever. Yeah, I know senior year is important, which is why I made a conscious effort to attend the college enrollment fair. After a while of wandering around, I found myself drawn to the social science section of one university. This was it. This is what I wanted to major in. This was so exciting. I'd finally found something else amazing besides the goth lifestyle. That night I asked Harper to take a photo of me to send with my application file. She gave me this dirty look and replied, You really think they'd want to interview a student looking like they belong in Dracula's castle? No, she did not just say that. How disrespectful. Why do people care so much about appearances? You pick someone due to their caliber, not the surface. Well... If looks are not so important, why don't you just quit being angry, get changed, and just take a simple photo? Harper raised her voice. Ugh, arguing with her was pointless. So I ran back to my room and locked myself in there for two whole days. Ugh, I hated this world. I had a lot of thinking time, which made me realize I do really want to major in social science. So I decided to listen to Harper, remove my makeup, fix my hair, and borrow her clothes for the picture. Oh. My God! No, I can't even look in the mirror. I looked horrible. But Harper thought otherwise. I told her to just take the dumb photo. 
but she ran off and dragged along my parents, who cooed and clapped on seeing my new look. You look so beautiful, honey! My mom held her chest. Were those tears in her eyes? Oh, man, this was so lame. This wasn't me. I'm not some insignificant, boring-looking girl. Ugh! As soon as Harper took the photo, I darted toward the door, desperate to return to my goth look. Please, Miranda. My parents both grabbed my arms. You look so much better this way. But this isn't me. If I don't stay goth, then I'll be losing myself. I shook them off. A few weeks later, I got a reply from the university. I had got through to the online interview stage. Whoa. But this time, I wouldn't change myself. During the interview, one professor asked me about my social experiences, such as part-time jobs or social volunteer services. Um, I hadn't done any. I'd thought of that once in a while, but due to my goth look, I didn't get to work anywhere. I admitted that to the professor and proudly announced, Being goth is my true identity. A few weeks later, I received their response email. Harper, Isabel, and my parents gathered around me in the living room, but, oh no, I muttered out once I opened the email. They rejected me. I stood up and tearfully ran back to my room, while Isabel followed me. Don't worry. Isabel sat down next to me and rubbed my arm. They have another enrollment in the autumn, so you still have a few more months to prepare. I don't need it anymore. Just leave me alone. I must have freaked her out as she quietly left after that. The next day, I was so bummed out, so I went to see my goth friends. Surely my own kind would make me feel better, right? People are ridiculous, but no one can stop us from being ourselves, Ralph heroically said. Well, I didn't feel any better, but at least there was someone on the same page with me. Still in a frustrated mood, I later on skipped dinner and went straight to my room. Harper then entered my room and talked to me in a serious tone. Stop sulking. I've seen that email and your profile. Here's the ugly truth. They didn't reject you because you're a goth. They rejected you because... You're just a bland person with below average grades and no social experience whatsoever. I threw my pillow at her, demanded she leave my room right now and never come back. But that night I couldn't sleep. Her words were bugging me. I don't know, maybe she was kind of right. I mean, I guess I could do more to help my case as I knew I really, really wanted to study that major at that university. So the next day, I started looking for a part-time job. But everywhere required this gross uniform and decent look. Jeez, come on! I just can't. I felt so terrible being something that I'm not. I was about to give up when Isabel came to me and said, Be strong. Think about your dream college and your future. She patted my back. This is just temporary, okay? What a sweet friend she is. All right, gotta get back on my feet. I patiently kept looking, and finally, a cafe accepted me as a waitress. Of course, no goth look, though. Ugh. One evening after work, I was about to go home when I ran into the goth group. Hey, guys! I cheerfully greeted them. What's the event tonight? Noticing their confused look, I said, It's me, Miranda. They burst out laughing. Seriously? Miranda, is it really you? Then some of them pulled out their phones and started taking pictures. My Instagram is gonna love this. While the others kept ridiculing me, this was heartbroken. I thought they were my people. Why didn't they give me even a second to explain? Now it turns out they were the most judgmental people ever. What a toxic group of friends. I wasn't going to waste my time hanging out with them anymore. Lesson learned. Over the next few months, I focused on working at the cafe, and I joined a group of active young people, handing out food for homeless people and helping nurses at old people homes. I'd experienced so many new things, and to be honest, I got used to this mediocre look. Actually, there's this one guy in my volunteer group. He's called Roger, and I may have a slight crush on him. At first, I didn't even notice him, because he looks normal. Basic haircut, t-shirts, jeans, and sneakers. Until one time, in a nursing home, I was struggling with this very bitter and difficult old lady who was accusing me of stealing her slippers. Then Roger, with his gentle nature and soothing voice, slid in and diffused the situation. On top of that, he was an amazing storyteller, as he always mesmerized everyone around, including me. Ah, 
Okay, so looking normal didn't mean someone was boring. Yeah, I know the saying, don't judge a book by its cover. Well, it turns out that saying is 100% true. In early October, Harper helped me apply again. And guess what? I successfully passed the online interview and received an offer email. My family was in seventh heaven. My parents couldn't stop the happy tears. While Harper just proudly smiled at me, and Isabel hugged me tightly. We even went on vacation to celebrate. It was terrific. Now, I still love my gothic look, but at the same time, I love my natural look, too. I've realized that identifying yourself by how you look on the surface is nonsense, and so is judging people by the way they look. Having an interesting life and being beautiful is not just about obsessively focusing on how you appear. It comes from within. Wait, is that Roger over there? Oh no, he's coming this way. He's waving at me. Perhaps this is my chance. People often say love is complicated. Well, I wish I'd thought about that before I got involved in this ridiculous love story. It all started when my close friend Barry asked me to help him write letters to his crush, Cindy. You see, I'm a pretty good writer, and I know I'd get in trouble if people found out about this, but sometimes my classmates will pay me to help them with their homework, especially essays. So, anyway, when Barry asked me to help him win over Cindy, who he met when joining the play club of our school, of course I said yes. And no, I didn't charge him. I mean, he's my best friend after all. However, I had a plan. I'd been in love with my neighbor Alice ever since she moved in next door when we were kids. But I never had the guts to tell Alice how I really felt. Oh, and there was also one little problem. Alice had a serious crush on Barry. This was why I was so happy to help Barry win over Cindy. If Alice saw that Barry was no longer single, maybe she'd start noticing me. And then we could finally be together. So I agreed to help Barry. As I wrote that first letter, I just thought about Alice and the words came pouring out the way her hair shimmered in the sunlight and her cute freckles. Thankfully, Cindy had freckles too. I wasn't sure if Cindy would like it, but the next day Barry found a reply in his locker. And so it went on. Every day I'd write a letter for Barry, and it was clear Cindy was falling in love with who she thought was Barry. But then one day Barry came running over to me and he looked worried. He said Cindy wanted to go on an actual date. He was freaking out because he said there was no way he could pretend to be smart and funny like he did in the letters. And then he told me she'd ask if they could recite poetry together and that I'd need to train him somehow so he didn't give himself away. I would make it work. I had to, otherwise I'd never be with Alice. Just before Barry and Cindy's date, Barry was over at my place and I was trying to get him to practice reading some poems. He was terrible, but I couldn't tell him that. I just hoped Cindy wouldn't notice. When Barry left, he said I must follow him to his first date in case there's any problems arose. I was about to go when Alice came in and said her family would go to a restaurant to celebrate her brother's birthday tonight, and they would like to invite me to go with them. Of course I agreed. I was close to her little brother. Then in a hurry, I told her I had to go, and she asked where I was going. And I said, I'd promised my mom I'd buy some groceries for dinner. I quickly jumped in my car and drove to where Barry was meeting Cindy. I told him I'd be nearby in case there was an emergency. From my car, I can see into the restaurant and watch how the date was going. At first, it looked good. I was so busy watching them, though, that I didn't notice Alice was standing right next to my car. When she knocked on my window, I got such a fright, I almost leapt out of my seat. She asked me what I was doing and where the groceries were. Suddenly, she glanced over the window where Barry and Cindy were sitting together. Oh no, she has certainly discovered something. While I was totally frozen, she turned back to me with her extremely stunned eyes. Are you stalking Barry and Cindy on their date? Then she climbed into my car and constantly questioned me in panic. What are they doing? Are they seriously dating? Why didn't I know anything about this? Jeez, Cindy is my best friend. How could she? I was lost for words. She'd caught me. But then I asked her what she was doing here. She said that she was about to come and arrange the birthday party tonight, still angry. Anyway, as she was in my car, my heart started racing. Maybe this was my chance. Maybe I should tell her how I felt. As I turned to face her, I noticed she was looking at my phone. I quickly grabbed it, but it was too late. Barry had messaged me, and it had popped up on the screen. Help! What poem did you mention in your last letter? She's on to me! It seemed that Alice has understood all the story. She jumped out of the car so quickly I couldn't even stop her. She ran toward the restaurant and went straight up to Cindy. Barry had just gone to the bathroom, so he wasn't there. And as Alice told Cindy, I saw Cindy start crying. This was a disaster. 
And then the worst thing, Barry came back and Cindy started shouting at him. I quickly drove off. I couldn't bear to watch. This was all my fault. The next day, something crazy happened. I woke up and had a friend request from Cindy. I accepted her and she messaged me straight away saying she was seriously in love with me and she couldn't get my poems out of her head. I felt so guilty. What would she do if she found out I'd been thinking about Alice the whole time when I wrote them? No one knew about my crush on Alice and I decided it was better to keep it that way. Now that Barry wasn't speaking to me and Alice was so angry with me because of helping Barry. This was the worst situation ever. Even though Barry was upset with me, I'd never go behind his back and date Cindy. In fact, he couldn't find out that Cindy loved me. But later on, somehow Barry knew that Cindy loved me. He called me saying not only had I ruined his chances, I'd also stolen his love. Great, so I was suddenly the bad guy, when all I'd wanted to do was help out a friend. Neither Alice or Barry are speaking to me now. And at the same time, Cindy is constantly messaging me and always kept her eyes on me in school. I don't know what to do. I've lost my best friend and my crush, and instead gained a stalker. Hey, I'm Millie, I'm 14, and I have the biggest crush on my older brother's best friend, Jason. When my brother said Jason and his other friend were staying over that weekend, I was super excited. Things got even better when my parents planned a last-minute trip away, and our cool Aunt Cheryl came to stay with us. We both knew that she'd be too busy binge-watching her fave soap opera to care about what we did. That's why she's the coolest aunt. So I decided to also throw a slumber party, and I invited my two best girlfriends, Jane and Rosie, over. My plan was that we could order pizza and ask my brother and his friends to join, so I'd have a chance to hang out with Jason. I knew they'd say yes. I mean, when did boys ever turn down pizza? After we all ate loads of pizza, we watched scary movies together and played games. It was really fun. So fun, in fact, that even my usually moody brother couldn't stop laughing. I wore my cutest pajamas and was extra nice to Jason, making sure he always had a drink and stuff. We played two truths and one lie, and the boys lost, so we made them give up the mattresses in my brother's room for us to sleep on, as sharing my bed with two friends was kind of uncomfortable. The boys had to carry the mattress to my room and make the bed for us. It felt so good to be able to have one up on my brother and boss him around. Rosie and I got into my bed and Jane claimed the mattress as she tossed and turned loads in her sleep. For fun, we ordered the boys around a little more. I made them check the room for spiders and to take the trash downstairs. Then Jason turned off the light for us and said goodnight before they went back to their room. That was so sweet. We chatted for a bit. Then Jane said she felt left out, so she crawled into my bed. It was too cramped for me to sleep, but that didn't seem to stop the others from drifting off. I kept thinking about Jason and how I was sure he'd been looking at me as he turned the light off. I went downstairs to get myself a glass of water, and on the way back to my room, I heard noises coming from my brother's room. I listened outside of the door. They were playing truth or dare of some sort. I heard them teasing Jason about liking one of us and said that the next dare would be to sneak into the girl's room. Worried that they'd walk out and see me, I quickly ran back to my room. I didn't even have time to climb into my bed, so I threw myself onto the mattress and laid still. Then, a while later, I heard footsteps. It must be Jason. His shadow got closer to me, and it felt like he was leaning down. And then, he kissed me! OMG! I tried my best to pretend like I was asleep. Then, I couldn't hold it in anymore. I kissed him back. He gently stroked my hair, then left. I couldn't believe it. He liked me too? And that was my first kiss ever. The next morning, I woke up early, did my hair, put on a pretty dress, and made pancakes for breakfast. I made one in a heart shape for Jason, which I set up on the table. But when everyone came downstairs, my brother took that heart-shaped pancake and gave it to Jane before I could do anything. Did he like my best friend? Ew, no way. After everyone left, I immediately told my brother he couldn't like my friend, but he told me that she liked him too. He said he knew I liked Jason, so we should join forces and help each other out. That kind of sounded like a sweet deal, so I agreed. My brother set up a movie date for Jason and me by saying it's just a normal weekend hangout. Then he bailed out last minute. The date was perfect. 
I accidentally touched Jason's hand when we both reached for the popcorn. I thought that this was it. It's time for me to talk to him frankly. So after the movie, we grabbed a drink and I said to him, I know you like me. Let's stop acting as if nothing happened. He looked confused and laughed. Then I went on more specifically. You know, that night you came into my room? But he kept looking really lost, saying that he didn't go into my room that night at all. Then his phone rang. It was Jane calling him. Her picture showed up on the screen. Why does he have her phone number? He picked up and told her he'd be over shortly. I immediately asked him about it. Then he stuttered, saying that actually he and Jane had just started dating. They first met at my slumber party and had exchanged social media accounts and have been talking to each other nonstop ever since. He also said that they were thinking about how best to tell me and my brother about this. And thank you. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have met Jane. But what were you talking about before? Continue. Stunned, I quickly replied with, <laughs> Gotcha! I was just kidding. It was a dumb dare. My brother dared me to prank you because I lost a game to him. I made my excuses and swiftly left after that. I felt completely mortified. When I arrived home, I threw a tantrum and told my brother everything, including the part about me overhearing them playing truth or dare and the kiss. He just sat there listening with his mouth wide open. And then things all came to light. They dared Jason to go into the girls' room and draw on our faces, but he refused, so he chose truth instead, and he answered a question saying that out of all the girls, he liked Jane the most. After that, my brother felt uneasy. He was confident that Jane had eyes on him, too, so he pretended to go to the bathroom, and then he came into my room, and before he could stop himself, he kissed Jane, and she kissed him back. But turns out, it was me! I was the girl who was lying on the mattress. He then screamed at me. Why did you suddenly switch beds? While I screamed back, you stole my first kiss? This is so disgusting and awkward. We quickly calmed down and stopped yelling at each other because it's even too embarrassing to fight about. We then swore to keep this a secret till the day we die. And now we have two heartbroken siblings who have accidentally kissed each other in this household. Not to mention, from now on, we will have to watch our crushes being all lovey-dovey with our friends, too. This is a nightmare. Hey, my name's Jordan. I'm 16, and I'm determined to become a successful entrepreneur, despite my difficult home life. I live with mom and two little brothers in a trailer in a really rough area of town. Crime rates around me are really high. Our trailer's been broken into two times this year. And both times they took our television and the bills money that my mom kept in a pot in the kitchen. I share a bedroom with my two little brothers. Most of the time I end up sleeping on the couch in the living room so that I can have a bit more space. I know that mom does her best for me and my brothers, and she works three jobs as it is. She is constantly exhausted, but she always has a smile on her face and remains positive. I know that it isn't her fault, as she's trying her best. It's my dad's fault. He walked out on us when I was 10 and hasn't been back since. He left my mom for a younger woman and started a new family with her. He doesn't have time for us anymore. He always makes excuses so that he doesn't have to see us, which really sucks. Kids at my school teased me because most of my clothes were from a thrift shop. I used to avoid going into the canteen as I couldn't afford any of the nice food. Sometimes my friend Zach insisted on buying me cheese fries, and I always felt bad accepting them off him. Cheese fries are my favorite food along with meat feast pizza, but I wanted to be the one buying them for my friends, not the other way around. I wanted to help my mom out, so I took on this dishwashing job in evenings and at weekends. It was in a restaurant near where I live. I saved up my wages, but instead of giving them to my mom, I decided to invest them, as it's my dream to become a successful businessman. I bought a box load of snacks from this wholesale place, bags of chips, sweets, and chocolate bars. Zach helped me sell them at school, and I sold out by the end of the day. I gave Zach his cut of the money, and I invested mine into buying three more snack boxes, 
which also sold out by the end of the day. Someone reported me to the head teacher, Mr. Barlow, and he got really mad and banned me from selling snacks on school property. So I started selling them just outside of the school gates. Mr. Barlow called me into his office, and I thought he was going to shout at me. I hear you're still selling those snacks of yours, he said. Yes, I am, sir, but not on the school property. I see, he sighed. Look, I like you, Jordan, and I like your initiative, but I can't have you selling boxes of snacks by the school gates. But, sir, which is why I'm giving you permission to use the old janitor's storeroom to sell your snacks from. I stared at him open-mouthed. That was the best news I'd heard all year. Thank you. Thank you so much. I figured it would make more sense to have you on side than go against you. Besides, I admire your spirit. <laughs> he chuckled. My snack shop is booming. I open it every break and lunchtime, and Zach and this girl called Fiona help me run it. I give my mom some of the money I've earned to help her out. I'm saving up for a new laptop so that I can start an online business. Now I want to start my own business, selling bespoke snacks and treats. But in the future, I have a dream to be a successful businessman with my own chain of hardware stores. Every Friday at lunchtime, I leave Fiona running the snack shop, and I take Zach to the canteen and buy us both cheese fries. It's the small acts of kindness that go the furthest, and Zach has always been there for me, and I will always be there for him. I'm glad that I live where I do, because my upbringing has given me the drive to want to succeed, and I have no doubt that I will. I want to give my mom and little brothers the best life that I can, because they deserve that. Thanks for listening to my story. I've learned that determination and the ambition to succeed can help us to achieve our dreams, regardless of where we come from. Please give this post a like, and leave a comment with any dreams that you have that you plan on making a reality. Bye, Auntie. I waved to her. I promise I'll be fine at home alone. That's good. I'll be back soon, B. Then she left. That's my Auntie Anna. I was staying with her while my parents were on vacation. I was about to walk back into the living room when the doorbell rang. So I immediately ran to the door and looked through the peephole. Ah, it was Mom! I quickly opened the door and rushed out to hug her tightly. Mommy, how come you're back so early? Mom stroked my hair and softly said, Oh, sweetie, I came to pick you up. How can I leave my little princess alone? Now, hurry up and pack your things. I gave a confused look. But Auntie Anna's at the grocery store. Shouldn't we wait for her? She shook her head. No, sweetie. I already called her. So we quickly packed my things, and Mom led me outside to a rather old car, which was completely different from our usual BMW. Mom, where's Dad? This isn't our car. I asked her. She knelt in front of me and smiling said, Daddy's waiting for us at the beach. It's going to be lots of fun. I jumped up and down excitedly. Yay! I couldn't wait to build sandcastles and splash in the sea. This was so cool. On the way, I must have fallen asleep, as when I opened my eyes, it was already dark outside. I got out of the car and looked around. Hmm... Where was the ocean? All I saw was some small house in an unfamiliar neighborhood. Beatrice, this is our new home. Just you and me from now on. Mom's sudden words totally woke me up. Mom, why? What about Dad? I stammered. Listen, I'm sorry. I can't explain it to you at the moment. You're too young to understand. I had so many questions flying around my head, but looking at Mom's sad face, I knew I shouldn't ask her anymore. The next morning, I woke up excited and curious about our new beginning here. I opened the curtain and saw a group of kids my age playing across the street. So, without thinking, I rushed outside to join them. Hello, I'm Beach. Suddenly, my mom came out of nowhere, a frantic look on her face as she shouted, I told you to stay inside, and pulled me back home. Everyone was gawping at us, including the man who lived across the street. It was so embarrassing. As soon as the door slammed shut, in a serious tone, she said, We just moved here. You shouldn't make friends with strangers that fast. And don't talk too much about yourself, okay? 
Mom had never minded me playing with other kids before, so why now? This didn't make any sense. After that, she only let me out of the house for school, and she always kept an eye on me, so that's why I couldn't make any friends here. I resented her so much. I was so lonely. One good thing about it was she didn't have any house rules, so I could spend all day watching cartoons while eating junk food, and she didn't mind at all. This was great, as before we moved here, Mom and Dad never let me do stuff like this. But eventually, I got sick of those junk foods. I felt kinda icky. I longed for Mom's special spaghetti with crab sauce, so I begged her to make it. At first, she refused, saying that she was very busy, so I kept on whining until she finally agreed. Later, I went to the kitchen for dinner, and the room was an utter chaos. Pots and pans everywhere. Mom looked messy, too, as she passed me a plate of spaghetti and meatballs instead of her signature dish. Well, okay, it looked delicious anyway, so I took a full fork of it as Mom watched on. Poof! Water! I need water! Gosh, it's so salty! Mom quickly replaced my pasta plate with a box of fried chicken and said, Today I'm busy, so I was a bit distracted. Sorry, honey. Her awkwardness made me laugh. Nah, it's okay, Mom. Mom did seem really busy lately, as her phone was always buzzing. The calls even came late at night when I was asleep, so she always quietly went out to answer it. Guess it's hard being a single mom after all, so I tried to be more understanding. And just like that, time passed. Staying inside and having no friends became the norm for me. Still, I often sat by the window and stared longingly at the kids playing outside. Then one time, when I was doing this, Mom appeared and asked me if I wanted to go to the nearby amusement park. Wow, could there be anything better than this? I leaped up, clapped excitedly, then wrapped my arms around her. Honestly, the park was pretty small, and everything seemed kind of tired looking. But this didn't matter, as it was the best day I'd ever had. Mom never used to like rides or games, but today was different. She even got excited when she saw the beanbag throwing stall. She knocked the tins down in one go and won me this giant cuddly bunny. I've never seen her have fun like this before. My mom is so cool. Afterward, mom left me sitting on a bench and she went off to get some ice cream. Suddenly, I saw her rushing back and without ice creams. She pulled on my hand and in an urgent tone said, We need to go home. We're moving. So we packed up our things and left in a rush. I kept on asking mom what was going on, but she dodged my questions. During the car journey, I heard her mutter to herself, We're going somewhere new. It'll be exciting. A new adventure. Yes, it'll be fine this time. I may have been young, but I wasn't stupid. I knew she was hiding something. But she's my mom, and I didn't want to upset her by bugging her with questions. So I stayed quiet and eventually fell asleep. Once again, I woke up in an unfamiliar place and stared out of the window. I wasn't as bothered about this place as I was about the last. I didn't want to get too attached to it, as I didn't know how long it'd be before mom made us move again. But there was one thing that bothered me. Across the street was a man looking straight at our new house. Hmm... He looked identical to our previous neighbor. Maybe he'd just moved here too? What a coincidence. I mentioned the man to mom, but she told me she didn't know him, and then sternly told me never to interact with him. At school, I was the strange kid who didn't talk to anyone. The older I got, the worse this felt. And the other kids laughed at me, and I heard them call me weird behind my back. I felt so lonely and depressed. So at home, I often just sat by the window with a book and tried to pretend that the adventures I was reading about were happening to me. <sighs> Worse still, Mom was acting even odder than usual. The other day when I got home from school, I found her chucking perfectly good food out of the fridge. Some were even brand new. I asked her what she was doing and she replied, It's gone off, so I'm getting rid of it. Then she started scrubbing the fridge. The smell won't go. Why won't it go? What was she talking about? Everything seemed fine. What's happening? Then I discovered that mom often left the house late at night and didn't return till dawn. 
I knew if I asked her about this, she wouldn't say anything. So that night, I snuck out and followed her. Mom was wearing dark clothes with a hat and a big scarf covering her face, even though it's not that cold outside. Hmm, why the disguise? Then, can you believe it? I spotted her going over to the neighbor's house and cuddling him on his porch. I jumped out of the darkness and shouted, Mom, what's going on? I thought we weren't meant to talk to this man. She gave me an alarmed look. I... At that moment, Mom received a text. In a panicked voice, she said to me, Beatrice, we have to go. Now, I'll explain everything later, I promise. Right after that, the mysterious man waved at us and told us to get in his car. Then he sped through the night. After regaining my senses, I turned to my mom and asked, I hope this explanation is good. Um, actually, we're in danger, honey. It's your dad. He's an imposter. I only figured this out when I was on vacation with him and I've been running from him ever since. What? I'd never suspected my dad of being someone else. It made no sense. Then, through sobs, my mom continued to say that my real dad was actually a member of a secret organization, but he had been missing for a while, and now the organization was after us. She often received anonymous messages and calls threatening her. She didn't want me talking to strangers in case they were spies. And those times when she threw all the food out was because she'd received texts threatening to poison the food in our house. She wiped her tears away, then said, This is Joe. We went to college together, and he's been such a help. We fell in love, but I didn't dare tell you because I was afraid you wouldn't understand. I looked at this Joe guy. I don't know. There was something off about him. But maybe I was just being paranoid. I mean, he had helped Mom out, right? Ah! What's that? Ever since I found out about the secret organization, I've been kind of jittery. What if they suddenly turn up and take me and my mom away? I know mom's worried too, as she seems so distant. I just want to make things better for us both. Then Christmas arrived. It was quite the special one, as for the first time since we went into hiding, we had guests. Well, one guest, Joe. We raised our glasses for a Merry Christmas, but instead of putting it down, my mom gulped it back in one go. Mom, are you drinking tonight? I asked skeptically. Of course, my dear. It's Christmas. Let me tell you, I'm no less than a man when it comes to drinking. <laughs> I chewed on my lip as I thought about this. Mom had an alcohol allergy, and at the most, she only had tiny sips. Suddenly, a thought came to mind. Maybe Dad wasn't the imposter after all. Maybe it had been Mama all along. She enjoyed the roller coaster rides, though, to my recollection, Mom was afraid of heights. She couldn't cook, she now loved Joe, a strange man, and she could downed alcohol without being ill. If this was true, then who could I trust now? Something wasn't right. I could feel it in my gut. So the next day, I secretly went to the cops instead of school as usual. Then I found out something crazy. Turns out, my real parents had been looking for me for over the past six years. O-M-G. As for the mother I was living with, who was she? I tried to stay calm while waiting for the police to contact my parents first. And as soon as they got there, the three of us broke down in tears. That's when my real mom told the whole truth. Actually, she had a twin sister called Linda. No one had ever known about Linda, as due to her debt problems, my grandpa rejected her and forbade her to ever show up in front of anyone in the family. But my mom couldn't disown her own twin, so she secretly gave her money. Then one time, Linda was asking for too much that mom turned her down. Unexpectedly, she came and took me away to pressure my mom to send her more money. During that time, my mom kept transferring her money to make sure I'd be provided for. She hadn't given any information about Linda to the cops, though, because Mom still wanted to talk to her first, though, so that her sister wouldn't end up in trouble. Wow, this was a lot to take in. After that, Mom ran over to Dad, who's in line to talk to the police. She grabbed his hand and begged him to give Auntie Linda a chance. 
Um, as you see, I missed out on having a normal childhood because of my aunt, and what she did was wrong. But there's a part of me that will always care for her, as she raised me for all these years. And my heart urged me to say, Dad, I didn't want to turn her in either. My dad looked at me hesitantly, but in the end, he nodded in agreement. So we decided to deal with it ourselves without the intervention of the police. Then, the next day as planned, I was in the front yard with my fake mom when her identical twin marched up to our house and confronted her. Once my Auntie Linda got over the initial shock, she confessed everything to me. <sighs> it was sad, but glad that it's all over now. Mom paid off her sister's debts with one condition, that she would never, ever get near me again. Now I'm back home, with my actual parents. It's going to take some getting used to, as I've forgotten how to make friends. And going outside alone makes me nervous. Looks like the memories of the adventure with my uninvited Aunt Linda might follow me for quite some more time. I know I have to try and move forward. I can't get back the past six years, but I can do my best to try and embrace the future. It was a normal Monday morning. I was standing by my locker when this Layla girl walked over, leaned against the locker next to mine, and talked to me in this sultry voice. Hi, handsome. Do you have any plans after school? I looked around in confusion. Huh? Was she talking to me? Usually girls like Layla didn't talk to guys like me. I mean, come on, look at her. She's the hottest girl in school. While I'm Felix, <laughs> just your average-looking nerdy guy. I awkwardly replied, Oh, hi, uh, I'm just doing my homework after school, bye. Then I left her there, dumbfounded. But it didn't end there. At the end of school, she approached me again and asked, Do you want to hang out with me? Followed by a wink. Uh, no thanks, uh, I really have to finish my paper on the French Revolution. Then I walked off. Man, did she really want to hang out with me? <laughs> no way. She must have lost a bet or something. Even on the next day, Layla, one more time, made a beeline for me with this scary, determined look on her face while I was chatting with my friends. And in a serious tone, she said, Look, Felix, do you want to be my boyfriend? What? All my friends started to cheer. I was so embarrassed that I shooed them away to get some privacy with Layla. Um, I'm flattered, but no. She scowled at me. Excuse me? Do you realize that I'm Layla Hall, the prettiest and most popular girl in this entire school? Not to mention a member of the cheerleading team. Ugh, cheerleaders are so dramatic. I calmly replied, Sorry, but you're just not my type. She shouted back, What? I'm everybody's type! I just shrugged and left. My god, that was awkward. But at least she got the hint now, right? Well, wrong. Because that's when the trouble just began. Firstly, it was this flood of junk emails and newsletters. Then strange phone calls from the spa nail salon asking if I had made appointment for the day, which I obviously didn't. On top of that, there's a fake Facebook account that started spreading unflattering pictures of me around, picking my nose in French class, pulling this weird tongue-out concentration face as I checked over my essay. There was even a slow-mo clip of me chewing like a camel as I enjoyed my burger. Man, I was an ugly eater. While I was scrolling through these pics, Layla jumped out at me with a big smirk on her face. Be my boyfriend, then the pranks will stop. Right, uh, of course it was her. Didn't she have better things to do? I shook my head and said, Pfft, No thanks. This still beats being with an annoying girl like you. Then a few days later, as I walked into school, I noticed that everyone was giving me dirty looks. Was my shirt inside out or something? Nope. So, what was the problem? I asked some of my friends and, jeez. Layla told everyone that I kissed her, then ghosted her. She's a real-life Harley Quinn. Hot, but totally crazy. Only a lunatic like the Joker could love her. I'd had enough of her antics. I couldn't let her make me look like the bad guy for something I didn't do. So at lunch, I charged over to her table and yelled in her face. Are you crazy? Why can't you understand that I don't like you? Then I shouted so everyone could hear me. Hey, listen, this rumor about me kissing and ghosting Layla is a total lie. She made it all up because I refused to date her. So please, save your dirty looks for someone else. Thank you. Layla shoved past me and ran out of there. Ugh, okay, maybe I was a little harsh. But you'd brought it on yourself, princess. Then, during French class, she was absent, but no one knew where she went. Was it maybe because of me? Nah, probably not. But as I was walking home, I spotted her sitting alone on a swing in the playground. 
Just go, Felix. This girl only brings trouble, I thought to myself. But oh man, she looked so sad. So the next thing I knew, I was walking over and sat on the swing next to her. I asked, why weren't you in French class? Just leave me alone. Stop pretending you care. Look, I took a deep breath, then continued. I'm sorry for yelling at you in front of the whole school. That, that wasn't cool. But what you did to me wasn't cool either. Shall we call it even? Layla stayed quiet for a bit, but then she nodded and smiled at me. Well, that wasn't so bad, right? So from then onward, everything was fine between us. She even smiled at me in the hallway. Whenever I saw Layla, this warm feeling came over me, and I couldn't stop grinning. Once, I even spent my entire lunch break trapezing around school just so I could catch a glimpse of her face. Oh boy, I think I've fallen for Layla. But why now? I tried to ignore these feelings, hoping they'd eventually go away. But then Valentine's Day came along, and Layla, being the popular girl she is, received enough roses to open a florist. Ugh, how annoying. I needed to do something. So after school, I went to her house with some chocolates and a teddy bear. As soon as she opened the door, I blurted out, I know I'm a big dumb idiot. Rejecting you was a huge mistake. Please, will you be my valentine? I stood there red-faced and prepared for rejection. But she just snatched the gift out of my hands, then said, Yeah, okay then. Oh my god, I couldn't believe it. Me, your regular nerdy guy, was dating the most popular girl in school. Love is really unpredictable. I was amazed at how open she was to my nerdy stuff. She even watched The Mandalorian with me and cooed whenever she saw Baby Yoda. But the one thing that didn't gel so well between us was, yep, you guessed it, studying. Layla didn't seem to care about her grades, and I didn't want her to fail, so I offered to be her tutor. But she was constantly yawning and staring out of the window whenever we started studying. Felix, I have an idea. Why don't you do my homework for me? In the meantime, I can go to cheerleading practice as we have an important contest coming up, and it means the world to me, just like your math quizzes do to you. What? Was she serious? My God, I hated cheating like this. But she gave me that puppy-eyed look, and me being the sucker I am, I agreed. Thanks, Felix. You're the best. She kissed me on the cheek, then immediately passed me a huge pile of homework. I asked her why she had so much, and she explained that because she didn't understand it, she let them pile up. But hold on, why did she have Spanish? She was in French class with me, not Spanish. But she just shrugged and said her parents forced her to study it outside of school. Oh, my poor little pumpkin. One day, like usual, I stopped by her place to pick up her homework, but she wasn't home. That was odd. Today wasn't cheerleading practice, so where could she be? I looked through the stack that she asked her mom to give me and saw some Spanish worksheets. So I said to her mom, Oh, she must be in her Spanish lesson, right? Her mom looked a bit confused and laughed. <laughs> you know Layla. She's far too stubborn to agree to extra classes. Huh? So the papers weren't hers? Then whose it was? And why? Suddenly I felt this uncomfortable feeling itching under my skin. I decided to confront her later at school. Then the next day I was walking through the hallway looking for Layla, when I suddenly heard some guys cheering, something about getting an A in Spanish. Wait a minute, did he say Spanish? I turned to see who it was, and to my shock it was Hector, the captain of the soccer team. Hector was popular for being all handsome and everything, but also for sucking at school. Someone must have done his homework for him, and you guessed it, yeah. This someone was me. Ah, it all made sense now. Layla and Hector must be a couple. They may have been hot stuff, but they both sucked at studying. So she was using me to do both of their homework. It all made much more sense now. None of this relationship was real. It was all just an act. And no way was I letting them get away with this. I had a perfect plan to expose them. During lunch, I sat down at the table closest to Hector. Then I went into lovey-dovey overload with Layla. I fed her cheese fries, then I stroked her hair and loudly told her how soft it was. I quickly glanced over at Hector for his reaction, but nothing. He seemed more interested in her burger than her. Layla raised an eyebrow at me. Um, are you okay? You're acting really weird. I laughed loudly, then placed my arms around her, then said, well, um, it was actually more like shouting. Oh, because you're so cute! But huh? Why was there still no reaction from Hector? He and his friends even cheered, and on his way out of the canteen, he gave me a thumbs up. Layla didn't look phased at all either. Man, somebody call the Academy, because these two deserved an Oscar. My plan was a massive fail. Ugh, this was so frustrating. I fell silent, and Layla noticed and gave me this quizzing look. Something is definitely off. You're being really strange. Okay, if she wanted to know, then fine. So I blurted out. I know that the Spanish papers belong to Hector. You're together and you're just using me to do all your homework. 
I'm not stupid, you know. Nice meeting you, but please don't ever talk to me again. Then I left without saying a word. Well, that's the end of my story. A rather sad one, right? I would be lying if I said I wasn't feeling down about it. I truly do love her. <laughs> Whatever. I'm going to college in a few months, and I'll get to meet a cute, geeky girl who won't trick me into doing some other dude's homework. <sighs> oh, uh, sorry, guys. Someone's calling me. My God, it's Layla. What does she want? We're done. Stop calling. What? Fine. I promise you'll leave me alone after this? Okay, wait. I'm coming downstairs. Uh, oh, my God. Layla's at my front door, and she insists to not leave unless I have a talk with her. Ugh. Don't move, everyone. I'll tell you every detail as soon as I'm back. Jesus, guys, you won't believe what Layla's just told me. The thing is that her cheerleading team had to practice a lot for upcoming contests, which means they couldn't study as much. Therefore, they had to find someone who was willing to do their homework so their grades wouldn't slip. That's when Layla came up with the plan to win me over as her boyfriend. The flirting, the pranks, <laughs> they were all part of her plan. That was the truth. But Layla didn't know about the Spanish worksheets, because her teammate Harper gave them to her. Turns out Hector is Harper's boyfriend. Didn't see that coming, right? But I was still super mad at Layla, because she still used me. Then Layla took out some papers and showed them to me. Huh? It was homework with all B's on them. Then she told me, Okay, I admit that at first I didn't like you. I only approached you to take advantage of you. But then I actually fell for you as I got to know you better, okay? So I stopped giving you my homework and did it on my own. So, her feelings for me were real too? I couldn't believe it. Eventually I forgave her and now we're happier than ever. I must say, when Layla first talked to me, I thought she was this crazy girl like Harley Quinn, who I could never like. But I was wrong. Turns out I'm the one who's crazy about her. So, I guess I have more in common with the Joker than I first thought. <laughs> okay, Cupcake, say ah. Ah. Ugh. Were they actually feeding each other? Seriously? How was I meant to concentrate on the movie with them doing that? Ugh, gross. Annoyed, I stood up, tipped my bucket of popcorn on their heads, then walked off. Don't panic. I'm not a crazy person. They weren't some random couple. Nope. I know them. The girl, Shelly, she's my best friend. For as long as I can remember, it was just me and her. Best friends against the world. But then one day, this guy, Leon, showed up out of nowhere, and boom! They started dating. Do you know what the worst thing was? This Leon guy was two years younger than me. He was so immature. Seriously. Every time I made plans with Shelly, he tagged along too. Suddenly, my phone rang. It was Shelly. I rolled my eyes as I answered, knowing she'd be furious. Peter, how could you? I keep finding popcorn in my hair. It's gross. You're so childish. Yeah, yeah, whatever. She was the one who turned me into a third wheel for our scheduled movie night. I ended the call. I was done talking to her. That's when I saw the news article pop up on my phone. There was a weather warning for a freak magnetic storm. It was advising everyone to stay at home and turn all technological devices off. Well, that was fine by me. It's not like I wanted to stay out anymore anyway. So I went home and went straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up and... Huh? Why was my dad sitting at the end of my bed? I rubbed my eyes and asked him what was up. He seemed lost in thought, but then he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Nothing, son. If you feel like you want to talk, I'm here for you. I understand. Then he left my room. Huh? What was that all about? I went downstairs for breakfast. That's when I heard my granny say, I will prove to you guys that he's not. Then I heard Dad say, Mother, it's no big deal. Even if it's true, he's still our Peter. But when I walked into the kitchen, they all fell silent and gawped at me. I said, um, hey, you guys, what's the topic? Then my mom replied while passing me a plate of pancakes. Nothing, son. Even my younger sister, Lena, was acting strange. She gave me this weird smile, then shook her head. Okay, this was odd, but I just shrugged it off and ate my breakfast. Afterward, mom asked me to help her out in the rock garden. Yeah, sure, I mean, it's not like I had anything better to do. Now, let me tell you, those rocks are way heavier than they look. As I struggled to carry one, I puffed out to mom, Where do you want this? It's so heavy. <laughs> can you call out dad to help? Shaking her head, she said, No, you can do it. You're not a weak boy. 
Then she continued to direct me to carry the pile of rocks all over the garden. I carried on until I had jelly arms and couldn't manage it anymore. I told Mom I needed to take a break and began to head inside. She shouted after me, No, you can do it by yourself. You're a big, strong boy. I didn't get it. Why couldn't she see that I was exhausted? That's when I spotted Shelly peering at me over the fence. She smiled and waved me over. Hang on. Wasn't she still in a mood with me? So what had changed? Whatever. I needed to escape Mom, so I went over to her. She apologized for yesterday, then asked me if I wanted to go shopping. I agreed. Anything to get me out of lugging more rocks about. As I walked over to Shelly's car, I spotted my neighbor standing outside of his house. I smiled over at him, but he gave me this odd look, then started giggling. I quickly looked down at my pants. Nope, I hadn't forgotten to do my zip up, so why was he laughing at me? I was thinking about how weird everyone was being as I got into the car. Then I thought out loud, maybe it's the storm? It sent everyone bonkers. Then I told Shelly about all of the crazy things that had been going on. She nodded and said, yeah, it must be down to the storm. Hmm, well, it didn't make sense, because I'd read about magnetic storms and how they could impact people's moods and stuff. At the mall, we went into a shop and I helped her choose some clothes to try on. I picked up a purple dress and told her it was a lovely color, when suddenly my granny jumped up out of nowhere and said, No, you don't love it. Follow me. I'll get you some new clothes. Then, before I could work out what was going on, she was pulling me out of the shop. I was so confused. Granny, why are you here? Did you follow me? She smiled up at me and replied, Peter, darling, don't blame me for wanting the best for you. Huh? This was strange, but okay. I was about to get new clothes, so I didn't think I needed to question more about it. We ended up in this vintage shop, and I felt like I'd stepped into a time loop. All the items were from the 80s or even older. She started grabbing items off the rails and saying things like, Ooh, I like this one. And you'll look very handsome in this. This wasn't my style, but Granny looked so excited, and I didn't want to hurt her feelings. So yeah, I ended up trying the clothes on. I looked ridiculous. Granny seemed delighted. She gasped, clapped, and exclaimed, Oh my, you're such a handsome boy, while Shelly was trying her hardest not to laugh. After that, we all went home, and yep, I was wearing the funny outfit. Everyone was pointing and laughing at me, but Granny seemed oblivious to this. She just smiled and said, All the girls will fall for you now. <laughs> yeah, right. I doubt it. Later on, I was in my room minding my own business when my phone beeped. Hey, I go to the same college as you. I saw you yesterday and I like your style. Do you want to hang out sometime? Lily, X. Huh? Was this someone's idea of a joke? I didn't know this number, nor this Lily girl. What was going on? The magnetic storm had sent everyone loopy, and I seemed the only sane one left. I immediately texted back that I wasn't interested, but geez, this girl was stubborn, and she wouldn't stop messaging me. Over the next few days, Granny's bizarre behavior continued. It was stressing me out. She kept giving odd looks in my direction and muttering stuff to Mom about me. But then one time she actually followed me when I was on my way to the shop and asked me why I wasn't in the outfit she'd bought for me. When I told her it was in the wash, she looked upset, shook her head, and mumbled out something about how I'd never find a nice young lady in my scruffy clothes. I tried messaging Shelly about it, but you guessed it, she was too busy with Leon to talk. So, in my loneliness, I turned to Lily. She was really sweet and said that my granny was probably just having an old people crisis as the same thing happened with her gram, and that we should meet in the park and discuss it. I agreed to meet her, and while I was waiting for her to show up, this guy with movie star looks walked over. At first, I thought he was going to ask me for directions or something, but then he said in a flirty voice, Hey, you're on time. Then before I could say anything, he continued, It's me, Lily. Um, what was going on? This was insane. I asked him, Okay, so what game are you playing at? He looked confused, then shook his head and said, Well, I just want to hang out with you. Then he came closer to me and leaned on my shoulder. I pushed him away and stepped back. Oh, no, I'm not gay. He frowned at me, then shouted out, What? You are. 
everyone knows that you are. I stood there feeling puzzled when who should show up but my sister Lena. I asked her, what the hell are you doing here? With a Cheshire cat grin on her face, she said, just testing out if you're gay or not. And I have the answer. You're not. Now I'll have to tell mom and granny. Then she pulled out her phone. I grabbed her hand and said, hold on. What? Gay? Who said that? What's going on? I'm talking about the rumor. A couple of days ago, the neighbor told mom that you're gay. Dad was cool about it, but mom and granny didn't take it well. Anyway, I told them I'd find out for sure. At first, I thought you were because you weren't interested in Lily, but now... She looked at the guy. My friend Robbie confirmed you're not. Okay, this was crazy. But where did this rumor come from? I asked my sister and she replied, Oh, they heard it from Leon. Leon? Hmm. This was suspicious. So I went over to Shelley's for answers. As soon as she opened the door, I rose my eyebrow and asked her, So, Shelley, everyone thinks I'm gay and apparently it's down to something Leon said. Would you happen to know anything about this? She blushed. Peter, I'm sorry. Leon was so jealous of you that I ended up telling him you were gay, just so he'd be cool with us hanging out. I gritted my teeth in anger, then yelled, I can't believe you ruined our friendship over that guy. So you'd rather spread wrong rumors about me than put some actual sense into your ridiculous boyfriend's head? You're so selfish. Well then, go live happily ever after with him as you wish. I'll stay out of your way. Then I hurried off. Later, she tried to call me, but I just turned off my phone. The next morning, I woke up and checked my social media to see a notification from Shelly pop right up. She had written a long post to tell everyone the truth and to apologize to me. Perplexed, I came downstairs to grab breakfast while considering if I should forgive her. Then I saw sitting in the living room was Shelly. Mom said she'd come over since early morning to apologize to me and my family. Come, dear. She knows what she did wrong, Mom whispered to me before leaving us two alone. Shelly came right up to me. Peter, I'm really sorry for being a jerk. You're my best friend, and Leon will just have to like it or lump it. I can get another boyfriend, but I never want to lose a friend like you. She spread out her arms. I hesitated. Then we eventually hugged it out. So, Shelly and I are best friends again. My family, well, they're back to normal levels of craziness. Yeah, it wasn't cool of Shelly to start a rumor about me, but so what if it turned out I was gay? I told Granny and Mom this. I guess they're both just old-fashioned and need to get with the times a bit more and realize that it doesn't matter if I like girls or boys, as either way, I'm still me. They're same old Peter. At the end of the day, yep, I'm that guy who thought that the magnetic storm turned everyone crazy. One thing's for sure, Shelly will never let me forget this. It was just a regular school day and I was sorting out my locker when suddenly I heard hushed whispers and noticed that everyone else was staring at something. Okay, so turns out it wasn't a something, but a someone. As this pretty girl strutted down the corridor like it was a runway or something. Ugh. Why was everyone golfing at her, rushing over to greet her and sticking notepads in her face for her to sign? I hugged my books and muttered, Geez, there's nothing special about her. So, my name's Lily and I'm just a normal girl. My family, yeah, they're normal. My appearance, normal. And my social status, well, that's just normal too. I coast through life and that's it. Nothing exciting ever happens to a regular girl like me. Oh, how I long to be the perfect looking girls on Instagram. They're so flawless in their clear skin, stylish clothes, and glossy hair. But those girls were different. They were from different worlds. Oh well, at least I still had my books, my bestie Sarah, and my cute boyfriend Brian. But this all changed when Stacy rocked up at school with her perfect looks and her I'm so sweet and friendly routine. Yeah, right. So what if she had a prettyish face and a bit part in some TV show underneath the fake shine she was clearly not all that? I walked into English class to see her sitting at the desk next to mine. Ugh! 
great. I couldn't even get to my seat because everyone else was surrounding her, asking her dumb questions such as, What shampoo do you use? And do you get snack breaks when you film your show? Jeez, give me a break instead. Then, when I finally managed to sit down, she smiled at me and in this sickly sweet voice said, Hi, I hope it's okay I sit here. I'm Stacy. Yeah, sure. I forced a smile back, but on the inside, my anger was boiling over. Who did this girl think she was? So what if she was beautiful? I bet she only cared about her looks and never bothered studying. Yeah, everyone else would soon realize what a failure she was. Then, one time during recess, Stacy, the living Barbie doll, suggested we start a yearbook and now everyone's treating her like she's achieved world peace or something. Ugh, you know the worst part of it? I've been saying we should start a yearbook for years, but no one listened to me. And guess who received so many welcome cards and love notes that they fell out of her locker and obstructed the hallway? Yup, Stacy. Gosh, it's been like weeks already. When will these stop? I hated how she thanked everyone and blushed and ugh. I needed to be around a sane person who didn't think the sun shone out of her. She was everywhere. It made me sick. But thank God for lunchtime. It became the only peaceful time of the day for me when I could hang out with Sarah and not have to worry about Stacy. But ha! Huh, what was this? What was that Barbie doll doing sitting at our table and talking to my best friend. I walked over there and placed my tray down next to Sarah. Oh, hi Lily. Stacy just said the funniest thing. Great, I muttered under my breath. Lunch was an ordeal. Sarah ignored me and kept on asking Stacy dumb questions like, Is your co-star Kyle as handsome in real life? And how do you style printed skirts with a colored tee? Yawn! Later that day, due to a paint spillage in art, I was five minutes late out. Sarah had agreed to drive me home, but I went out to the parking lot. Her car wasn't there. Then I checked my phone and saw that she'd messaged me. Where are you? I can't wait anymore. I'll leave first with Stacy. See you tomorrow, X. What? Is she ditching me to give that phony a ride? We had been friends since childhood. How could she be fooled for Stacy's act and just throw away our friendship like that? Angry, I messaged her back. You abandoned me for Little Miss Popular? How could you? I get it. New one in, old one out. Well, thanks a lot. My phone buzzed with her reply. Lily, you know it isn't like that. You live up the road from school while Stacy lives much further away and she needed to get back in time to get ready for her filming schedule. Matter than ever, I quickly typed out my reply. What? Ever, it's too bad you'll always be a nobody in her eyes and she's just using you for a free ride. Then I chucked my phone onto my bed. I'd had enough. Sarah had made her choice and it was to be friends with that fake over me. Sarah may have fallen into the Stacy trap, but at least I still had Brian, right? One afternoon, I was talking to him out in the schoolyard when Stacy tottered past. Even her try to hard walk was annoying. She smiled over my Brian. Then she deliberately tripped up and dropped the books she was holding. I grabbed Brian's arm to stop him from going over, but he shook himself free from my grip and went over to her anyway. I watched him help her pick her books up, and then she blushed and squeaked out a thank you. She was the worst. When he walked back over to me with this big grin on his face, I couldn't take it anymore. So I blurted out to him, How dare you leave me to help her? He gave me a confused look. Lily, I was just helping her out. Yeah, right. You knew she dropped them on purpose to get your attention. But you went over there to her anyway because you think she's prettier than me. He sighed. You're being ridiculous. You know what? I can't deal with your selfish, jealous streak anymore. Let's just call it a day. We're done. Then he walked off. I stood there watching him, expecting him to cool down and come back. Only he didn't. This was all Stacy's fault. She'd stolen my best friend and my boyfriend. No more. It was time to show her that she wasn't so perfect after all. I scrolled through her social media pages for ideas, and it soon became apparent that she loves boys with toned abs who ride motorbikes. How predictable. I discovered this website where I could hire a boy to play with her heart, then ditch her. It's about time she learned how much it sucked to be undesirable and worthless. Ha! 
I found the perfect guy called Josh. He was 19, a gym addict, and he had a motorbike. Whoa, he was expensive, but it would be worth it, right? I arranged to meet him at the local coffee shop and geez, he was even more handsome in person. I wished I could use this money to actually make him mine. Sigh. So the deal is he's gonna flirt with Stacy, make her love him deeply and then break up with her. The next Monday, I walked out of school to see Josh parked up to the school gate holding his helmet and looking like he belonged in a movie. Naturally, every girl was staring at him. But he made a beeline for Stacy. Then, just one week later, I saw him picking up Stacy from the school. Whoa, I knew that. I knew I had chosen the right person. Josh was such a lady killer. They looked super close and I had to remind myself that he was just an actor and he was doing his job. <laughs> she was going to be so heartbroken. But a few weeks later and he was still picking her up. Huh? Why hadn't he broken up with her yet? So I called him up and asked him what was taking him so long. He replied that he would do it soon. He was just making her fall for him more before he did it. <laughs> Brutal. Only the weeks passed by and he still hadn't ended it. Then I was walking past the movie theater and I spotted them there kissing. What? This was not the plan. Furious, I had arranged to meet him the next day at the coffee shop. He walked over and couldn't even meet my eye as he said, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. I will refund you as soon as I can. Um, why? Have you fallen in love with her or something? I said jokingly. There was a long silence. Then he looked down at the table and muttered out, Yeah, I have. Why was I the only one on the planet who saw how fake she was? Thanks to her siren ways, I lost my best friend, my boyfriend, and now my savings. This was it. I needed to confront her. The next day at school, I tried finding her, but she was nowhere to be found. Then, as I passed through the school garden, I saw her sitting there. Gotcha. It's time to tell her exactly what I thought of her. I stormed over to her and opened my mouth to speak, but huh? Why was she crying? When she saw me, she managed to smile and said, Oh, hi, Lily. Is there a chance you could help me? I stared at her with disbelief. Did she think I was under her spell and would do her bidding? But then I saw what she was crying about. In her hands was her English essay with a big F on it. So I replied, um, why me? You're so smart. You answer all the questions in class correctly. I don't want to be judged on my bad grades. That's why I left my last school. The other kids call me a brainless beauty. I moved here for a fresh start and now... I'm still failing. Okay, so in that moment, I realized that there were things I was good at. My grades were good, and I was pretty great at remembering facts. I'd just been so blinded by jealousy that I lost focus on these things and only saw what I didn't have. None of this was Stacy's fault. She never actually done anything bad to me. I'd made it all up in my head because I was jealous of her. So I sat down next to her and said, No one's gonna call you that because I'll help you study. You will? She gave me a hopeful smile and I nodded. Thank you so much, she flung her arms around me. So that's how Stacy went from being my enemy to my friend. She's actually a really sweet and kind-hearted girl. No wonder why everyone admired her so much. And I was wrong to judge her on her appearance and not give her a fair chance. She's still with Josh and she doesn't know that I hired him to break her heart. But hey, she now has a hunky boyfriend who adores her, so that could be considered compensation, right? Brian and I are still over, but thinking about it, maybe this was for the best. I know I overreacted, but he gave me up so easily. And well, I want to find a guy who won't do that. As for Sarah, I went around to her house with a bag full of her favorite candy, and I apologized for being a jealous jerk. Luckily for me, she forgave me. Now, Sarah, Stacy, and I have become good friends. Sarah and I both help Stacy with her studies, and she gives us fashion tips. And you know what? I've come to realize that I'm pretty after all. I just needed to discover my spark. So finally, I learned that no one's perfect. Perfection is just an illusion. The most important thing is that we feel happy with what we own and never stop improving ourselves. So just be you and let everyone else concentrate on being them. I gripped onto the swing chains and stared down at my feet. Someone was walking over. It was Lydia. What's up? 
she asked, as she sat on the swing next to me. Hey. I managed a weak smile. It's probably nothing. It's just, my parents have been arguing a lot. Then this morning, Mom smelt some unfamiliar perfume on Dad's shirt and accused him of cheating. Is he really having an affair? Lydia rubbed my shoulder. No way! Your dad probably just got caught in a spray mist cloud at the department store or something. You shouldn't jump to conclusions that quickly. Your dad loves your mom. Anyone can see that, so don't worry. I mumbled a yeah in agreement. My name's Cora, and as corny as it sounds, before this incident, I've been pretty satisfied with my life. I'm attending a renowned university. I get along really well with my parents, and despite being an only child, I've never felt lonely, as I have my best friend, Lydia, for company. She's more of a sister to me. Regardless of the problem, I just needed to drop her a message, then we'll meet at our spot, which is the swings at the park. Yep, I had it all, and I thought nothing would ever change that. It turns out that I was wrong. So it all began with my dad. He was acting oddly. He often looked at his phone, then smiled to himself. And then he'd take his phone into the bathroom and not come out for ages. This didn't go unnoticed by mom, but when she asked him about it, he just shrugged and said that he had some problems with his digestion. Then, while mom was doing the laundry, she smelt an unfamiliar perfume on his shirt. She marched over to him, threw the shirt at his head, and demanded that he explained himself. Dad denied it and said it was probably just his work colleague's perfume and that she was overreacting. That's why I arranged to meet Lydia at our spot. And as usual, she was so sweet and supportive. Lydia was right. Maybe I had thought too much. I came home and caught mom crying in the kitchen. She looked at me with puffy eyes and said, Something isn't right. I just know it. He doesn't look at me like he used to. I sat down, hugged her and said, Mom, let's stop overthinking. I trust dad. He'll never betray us. I stayed to comfort her for a while, then eventually she calmed down. The next evening, Dad came home with a big bouquet of blue roses, Mom's favorites. Then he cooked dinner for us both as an apology for making us sad. Mom looked touched, and she also apologized for misunderstanding him. I told myself that things would be okay now, right? For the next few weeks, Mom and Dad seemed to be fine, but then, on my mom's birthday... We invited Lydia and her mom Josie over for dinner. My mom was busy in the kitchen, so I took the birthday gift off of Josie for her. That's when I smelt it. Her perfume. It was the same scent that had been on Dad's shirt. I was sure of it. Over dinner, I noticed that Josie kept on looking over at my dad and laughed at all of his dumb jokes. Oh God, was my dad having an affair with my best friend's mom? I felt like I'd explode, but I couldn't say anything to Lydia, as I didn't want to upset her. So I'd do my best to avoid my best friend until I figured things out. This worked for a few days, but then one day after a class, she rushed over to me and said, Cora, why are you avoiding me? I pretended not to hear her and kept on walking, but she grabbed my arm and continued, Did I do anything wrong? Will you please just tell me? I spilled out. I'm pretty sure that my dad's having an affair with your mom. At first, she looked shocked, but then she hugged me and kept on apologizing. It was all too much for me, and I burst into tears in her arms. She told me that she'd talk to her mom and find out what was going on. The next day, I met Lydia at our spot. She looked super awkward, then said, It's true. My mom had a month-long affair with your dad but she promised that it's over. My world came crashing down around me. I just couldn't believe it. Lydia hugged me and told me it'd be okay. I was so lucky to have such an awesome friend like her. We both decided it'd be best not to tell my mom. The affair was over, so why break my mom's heart now? I tried carrying on like normal, and for the next few weeks, it really felt like everything was okay. Dad was really sweet with mom, and he even surprised her with a posh dinner out. But then, one afternoon, I saw dad pacing the garden. He was on the phone with someone, and I heard him say, Okay, I'm coming now. Then he got into his car and drove off. 
I decided to follow him, and it soon became clear where he was going. He pulled up in front of Josie's house and then walked straight inside without knocking. My heart sank, so he was still seeing her. Without a second thought, I called Mom and blurted out, Mom, Dad's having an affair with Josie. I'm there now. Come and join me and we'll confront them together. Five minutes later, my mom showed up. She looked both sad and furious. We went straight to the front door and banged on it, and I yelled out, Open up! We both know about your dirty relationship! But suddenly, someone spoke behind us. Hey, Laura. Cora. Is everything okay? We turned around and saw Josie standing there with a grocery bag in her hand. I was about to tell Josie to stay away from my dad when Lydia opened the door and gave us confused looks. What are you doing here? Oh, do you want your dad? He's fixing the dishwasher. Then Josie said, Lydia, I told you to call a plumber out to fix it. The plumber said he was fully booked today, so I think that I could ask Mr. Roberts for help. She replied, Oh no! So it turns out I'd misunderstood what was happening and messed everything up. Suddenly, my dad appeared in the doorway and said to us, What's all this banging and shouting about? Right, we're all going home now to talk. As soon as we got home, Dad waved his arms about in anger, then yelled at Mom, You're crazy, jealous, and unreasonable, and I can't be around you anymore. I felt so bad. This was my fault, not Mom's. So I tried explaining this to Dad, but he just told me it wasn't my business and continued to shout at Mom. At first, Mom just sat there silently, but then she quietly said, is it any wonder I act how I do? I mean, you have been having an affair with my friend. Right. If you keep on being this ridiculous, then let's divorce. Then he stormed off. It was horrible. Now Mom was inconsolable, and I felt awful for telling her. That night, I messaged Lydia to meet up, but she called me instead. She told me that she'd called my dad to ask him for the plumber's phone number, but he said that he'd come and fix it. She also said that Josie and him really were over. Then she hung up. This was kind of odd, but I suppose Lydia was finding it tricky being stuck in the middle of things with her mom and me. I guess I just needed to give her some space until things cooled down. After that, mom and dad barely said a word to each other. Talk about tense. Then, one day, mom decided to move to my grandparents for a few weeks, as she needed time to think everything through. I didn't blame her, but I didn't want to stay home alone with dad, so I went and stayed with a college friend. One night, I came home to pick up some clean clothes when I saw it for myself. My dad was kissing her on the couch. I couldn't believe my eyes. He was such a liar. So I coughed to clear my voice, then said, Oh, so it's over, is it? They both looked up at me, and that's when my eyes met with hers. Only, it wasn't Josie. Nope, it was Lydia. She stammered out, Cora, why, why are you here? What? Lydia? So my dad had been having an affair with Lydia? How could the girl who was always there for me through high school breakups, bad grade mishaps, and growing pains do this to me? Then dad put his arm around her and told me everything that he had never had any affair with Josie. It was Lydia all along, and that they were in love and wanted to get married. It was all too much for me, so I rushed out of there. Lydia ran after me and called out my name. Then when she caught up with me, she grabbed my arm. Cora, wait, I, I want to explain. Your dad and I... I interrupted her. Why lie? Why say it was your mom? I'm sorry. I just wasn't ready for everyone to find out then. So I sprayed my perfume on my mom and made up the story that she'd admitted to having an affair with him. As for the dishwasher thing, well, I set that up, as I knew you'd follow your dad and call your mom. I feel bad, but your mom needs to know. He doesn't love her. He loves me. I jerked my hand away and shouted, You're such a liar! You don't deserve to be my friend, and you can't have him! He's with my mom. Suddenly, she changed her attitude, smirked at me and said, Cora, let's accept the truth. 
your dad is bored of your mom. Actually, I'll be your stepmother soon, my little daughter. Then she left. I had jello legs, and I was so overwhelmed that it made me feel dizzy. So I sat on the curb and tried to calm myself down. Then I called mom and told her everything. She cried a lot, but she thanked me for telling her the truth. After that, mom came home and told dad she wanted a divorce. Then she demanded that he move out. This was six months ago, and it's been hard, but mom and I are getting there. I haven't spoke to dad or Lydia since, although I've heard that they're living together. I know I can't avoid them forever, but I just don't know if I'll ever be able to forgive them. For now, I'm staying strong for mom and helping her through this. Then maybe one day in the future, if they contact me, I'll be ready to meet them and maybe, eventually, find it in myself to let them back into my life. Hey, Dan, how about we go to that Japanese restaurant I want to try? Um, but my mom's expecting me home for dinner, Dan awkwardly replied. Again? I rose an eyebrow. Predictably, his next move was taking out his phone and calling Mommy Dearest. Mom says eating out is very expensive. It's your idea, so you're paying, okay? Excuse me? Did I mishear him? Unbelievable. So, through gritted teeth, I said, Forget it. I'm going home. Then I left him standing there with a stupid look on his face. Yep, that idiot was my boyfriend, Dan. He's in his 20s, but every conversation is still, My mom this and my mom that. It's so exhausting. At first, I thought I'd found a manly, impeccable man to rely on. Instead, <sighs> It just goes to show you, you can't judge a book by its cover, y'all. It all started with me coming back to the country, and it was hard finding my feet here again. Also, I hadn't had a boyfriend for, let's say, a long time. I wasn't that desperate, but my auntie insisted on matchmaking me with this cute guy. I thought, why not? First impressions, Dan was fine... He'd just graduated from a prestigious college, and he seemed so gentle and kind. We spent a good time chit-chatting, so yeah, after that we started dating. It was swell at first, but then the abnormal details about him began to surface. We arranged a date at mine once. The plan was to cook a meal together, then relax watching a movie. But as soon as he arrived, he walked straight over to the couch and started watching TV without any helpful intention. I dragged him into the kitchen, passed him a carrot and the peeler. He looked confused, then stuttered, Er, but I don't know how. I tried to show him, but despite explaining it in great detail, Dan still fumbled to peel one lousy carrot. Then, yep, you guessed it, at one point he called his mom. Then he told me, My mom says the kitchen is a very dangerous place. I could cut or burn myself. We could go back to my place. My mom can do the cooking. I glared at his arms akimbo. Or or we can eat out, Dan mumbled. Only if it's on you, Claire. It's not my fault. I growled while shaking my head. Fine, then I'm not coming with you. Then I pushed him out and slammed the door shut behind him. What the hell just happened? Still, I told myself that maybe he was just scared since he has never cooked before. One time we were in a clothes shop, and I spotted this shirt that I knew would suit him. It wasn't his usual style, but I insisted he tried it on, and ooh, he looked so good in it. Dan seemed to like it too, as he admired himself in the mirror, then said, It does look nice, but wait, can you please take a photo so I can send it to my mom? Well, she's the one who buys all my clothes, so... What? So now he needed approval from his mom before he bought anything? Jeez. Anyway, I took a couple of photos and he sent them to his mom. They exchanged messages. Then he turned to me and said, Okay, mom says you can buy me it. Me? My eyes widened. Yeah, mom says you chose it so you should buy it for me. Wait, what? I literally froze for seconds, 
Speechless, I could only glare at him before I found the means to leave. Claire, what's wrong? Dan chased after me, but I ignored him. Okay, I admit that, after a few dates, it was easy to figure out he was a total mommy's boy. But I told myself that it was sweet he loved his mom so much, and I never expected it to be that extreme. After that, I used the silent treatment on him, but he wouldn't quit bugging me. Then, he told me he wanted to take me out to my favorite restaurant as a birthday treat. Ooh, this sounded great! Perhaps he'd realized something and wanted to make it up for me. We were holding hands and walking toward the restaurant when we passed by a shoe store, and in the window display were the perfect pair of boots. Well, I'm a girl, and it was my birthday. I pulled Dan's arm. Danny, look! I pointed at the boots. I want those. I grinned from ear to ear. Okay. Dan replied blandly. My smile faded. I mean, they'd make the best birthday present. Ugh, since when did a girl like me have to ask for a gift? Why? Dan shrugged. You like them, I don't. My face reddened with anger. But it's my birthday. Dan scratched his head and forced a smile. Sorry, babe. Last night I spent my allowance on some new games, so I'm broke now. Pfft, I sneered. Why don't you ask your mom? And he unexpectedly went mad. Hey, you're obviously the wealthier one. How come you keep asking me to buy you stuff? Enough! I stopped dead. I have never, ever dated anyone as awful as you before. You're a grown-ass man, so stop running to your mommy every time you forget how to turn the kettle on or stub your toe. And why on earth do you still get an allowance at your age? It's over. Then I turned to leave without letting him have the last word. So freaking unreal. Trust me, to arrive back in the country and end up straight into this bizarre mommy's boy circumstance. But yeah, at least I was finally free of him now. It's been a few weeks since then, but just the thought of Dan still made me so mad. Ugh, I needed to get out of here and live a little. So I called my close friend Philip and arranged to meet him and some of my trusted guy friends at a bar. Cheer up, little girl, he teased. I know what will put a smile on your face. Our gaming group found this hilarious player. All we have to do is throw a few compliments his way, and he buys us all new items. Then, whenever we go out partying after a victory, this noob also pays for it all. What an ego. I mocked, congrats, bros. Wish my ex-date was also that generous. Then I rolled my eyes. He never spent a cent. Well, at least not without asking his mom for permission first. Philip laughed with a surprise. Hey, this noob's the same. He brags that despite being broke, his mom came up with the idea of matching him with rich girls so he can be covered. Hold up. That didn't sound right. I had a real bad feeling about this. Then Philip pointed across the bar and said, Oh, speak of the devil, and patted my back. A chill ran down my spine as I took a deep inhale of breath and turned to see it was Dan. And oh, he had a new girlfriend already. I quickly made up some excuse and bailed before they saw me. That night, I couldn't stop thinking about Dan's new girlfriend. Whatever Dan and his mom were doing was no less than scamming. So, I arranged to meet up with Philip at a diner, and I confided in him about my history with Dan and how I was concerned about his new girlfriend. Philip offered to help and said he would try and find out more information. A few days later, he reported back with his findings. Turns out, Dan and his mom had learned the Claire lesson, so this time with his new girlfriend, Lizzie, they were playing it differently. Dan, as his mom had ordered, took some sensitive photos of Lizzie, and now every time she refused to pay for something, he threatened to post them online. OMG! This made me feel so sick! This poor girl was trapped and were sucked dry of all her money. This was extortion, and I was going to put a stop to it. It didn't take long for me to find Lizzie online. I then dropped her a message saying I wanted to help, and we arranged to meet up in person. After hearing me say that I knew the truth, Lizzie burst into tears. I can't let those pictures get out, so I have to keep on being his girlfriend and pay for everything. She rubbed the tears off her cheeks. I had to borrow money, and now the interest means I'm in thousands of dollars worth of debt, and I still have no guts to speak out. Let's put an end to this. 
I slammed my fist on the table. Be brave, Lizzie. I've got your back. The day after Philip and I went with Lizzie to tell her parents, it was bad. Her mom started blubbering and tried to cover her face while her dad went furious. No one does this to my little girl and gets away with it. Philip replied, Too right. The bad guys are going down. We spent the rest of the day gathering evidence, including all of the threatening messages Dan had sent her and the receipts she'd kept from the extortionate purchases he'd forced her to make for him. That was when Lizzie received a message from Dan. There's this expensive restaurant I want to go to. Babe, take me there tonight or else. Love you, X. Lizzie replied that she agreed. Then knowing Dan was out, we went around to his house. We confronted Dan's mom as soon as she let us inside. She was frightened and eventually confessed that she didn't have a job and it was Dan's dad who provided for them. As a result, she spoiled Dan so badly that it annoyed his dad, so he left. Then she sadly blurted out, He didn't say a word to me. He just left Dan a note that said, Take care of yourself and your mom. I knew Dan would be miserable without his luxuries, so I told him to find a rich girlfriend to spoil him, and this time, she looked from me to Lizzie to make sure she would be too trapped to ever leave. There was a knock at the door. She looked at us awkwardly before she went to answer it. We followed her, and that was when we saw two cops arresting her. She bursted into tears as they took her away. I guess she thought she was a devoted mother who was doing right by her son, when, in truth, she went about it in totally the wrong way. She ended up going to jail, and her house was sold to pay off Lizzie's debts. As for Mommy's boy Dan, as an accomplice, he ended up doing community restitution. Hey, this would probably do him some good, as he'd finally learn what a day's hard work actually felt like. Huh. Thankfully, Lizzie gradually got over this traumatizing event and was ready to start dating again. With Philip. Hmm. About me. Well, I'm still single, but I don't feel lonely anymore, as I have awesome friends. Besides, this way I have no guys bumming money off me. <laughs> Not to brag, but these are really tasty. I bet even Grace, my picky sister, would finish this whole thing in one sitting. My cooking abilities were definitely up there with Michelin star chefs. I took another bite out of a fajita when I heard noises coming from the living room. Ah, Grace must be back. There she was, sprawled out on the couch, surrounded by her handbag, heels, jacket, and other stuff. Grace, we've talked about this. I can't keep on tidying up after you. I have studying to do, I said as I picked up her things. Suddenly, Grace sat up, rested her head in her hands, then looked at me with sad eyes. An uneasy feeling welled up in my heart. Oh no, what was wrong? She sighed and as she glumly stared at the floor, she said, Easton, pack your things. We're moving out tomorrow. What? Again? I couldn't contain my shock. Why, Grace? Do you owe someone money again? Grace didn't answer, so I worriedly asked, How much do you owe this time? Seven thousand dollars, she mumbled. What? Seven thousand dollars? That's crazy. What did you borrow so much money for? I plopped down on the sofa in disbelief. I sat there, frantically wondering how to deal with Grace's enormous debt. Her extravagant spending habits had started after our parents passed away. I guess she was trying to numb out her grief with the latest must-have outfit. Then suddenly, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Come on, bro, I'm just kidding. Huh? I gaped at her. Grace, it's not funny. For an instance there, I actually thought we'd have to elope or something. She grinned at me. Um, if there's no debt, then why are we moving again? I followed her as she walked out of the room, took a piece of fajita, and popped it in her mouth. Then she began to tell me everything. Turns out she'd found herself a sugar daddy fiancé, and we were moving in with him. I frowned at her. So what, now you're marrying some granddad? Why do you... Without letting me finish my sentence, Grace tapped my head with her knuckle. Do you seriously think a beautiful and famous model like me would marry some old man? Yet, even as a famous model, you still can't afford all of your branded goods. Then you have to keep on moving house all the time to avoid the debt collectors. I winked at Grace. 
She was about to hit me on the head again, but I dodged it. Ha! The next morning, there was a knock at the door, so I opened it to find a good-looking man in his mid-forties standing there. Ah, turns out he's Owen, my future brother-in-law. Before I had a chance to say anything, Grace tottered over in her heels and wrapped her arms around his neck. Honey, why are you so late? I'm so nervous. Smiling, Owen said, Darling, there's nothing to worry about. Everything's ready to welcome you and Easton. They continued coddling each other, so I quickly walked away. Seeing them like that gave me goosebumps. Ugh, cheesy. Owen drove us to his house. Well, I say house, but it was more like a royal palace. Inside there was a classic design to the place, with a luxurious style. I spotted a girl about my age sitting on the couch. Her arms were folded, and she had a disgruntled look on her face. Owen looked at her and said, Vivian, why are you still sitting there? Come and welcome your stepmom and uncle. Vivian smirked and coldly replied, No thanks. I'm not in the market for a new stepmom, especially one who's barely out of high school. Then she stormed off, slamming the door behind her. Oh no, she hates me. Does she? Seeing Grace look worried, Owen, though obviously a little angry, still tried to reassure her. It's okay, she's just being a typical teenager. Give her a few days and I'm sure she'll be fine. As for me, I was a little... No, I had to admit that I was very nervous. Vivian's sharp-eyed look had made me feel uncomfortable. I mean, I think a tank full of sharks would have been more welcoming than her. Looks like my new home life wouldn't be easy. The next morning, while I was helping Grace take some pictures of her posing in the living room, you know, for the gram, she suddenly yelled so loud that I had almost dropped the phone. Hey, hey, take that dog out right now! Hurry up! I turned around and saw Vivian walking what looked like a white cloud across the room. Seeing that, I ran toward her and said, Vivian, please take it outside as Grace is allergic to dog fur. Vivian rolled her eyes and replied, This is my home and this is my dog. Then she sparked as she let go of the dog lead. Oops! Her fluffy cloud dog immediately ran over to Grace and started barking at her. Grace yelped out, grabbed the pillow, then tried using it as a shield as she continued to scream at the dog to go away. At that moment, Owen appeared from upstairs, and with an angry look on his face, he snapped at her. Vivian, get Teddy out of here right now. No, it's them who should leave, she argued, while her dog barked so hard that Grace huddled up tighter in the corner of the couch and cried nonstop. Vivian, you've been warned. If you do it again, then I'll have no choice but to find Teddy a new home. Owen shouted loudly. Vivian huffed out, then gave Grace a fierce look as she picked up the dog and walked off. Man, it was true that life here wasn't easy at all. And it was about to get a lot harder. The next day, I was rearranging my new room when I heard a loud noise coming from downstairs. I went to check it out and found Grace instructing two maids on where to hang a giant print from one of her modeling photo shoots. And laying on the ground was the picture of Vivian with Owen and her mom. Move a little right? No, a little left. Okay, Grace ordered them. I hurried over to her and asked, Um, what are you doing? She smiled. I'm just making a few decor adjustments. It looks far more luxurious now, don't you think? Then she picked a gray vase off the table and threw it into the trash can, then placed a double swan figurine in its place. Now that's much better, she rubbed her hands together. God, I know Grace was just trying to claim her position as host, but even so, she shouldn't have taken down the picture of Vivian's mom, if she knew. At that moment, a scream interrupted my train of thought. Vivian's. Sigh. I knew it. Grace, how dare you? Vivian blushed with anger. Then Grace interrupted her. This is my house too, and I have the right to put my mark on it. It makes the room look far more modern. No, you have no right. Take down that disgusting picture and put the old one back. This is my house, and your father will soon be my husband. So I can do what I please. So stop your childish strops and just accept it. Vivian resentfully picked up the family picture, then quietly took it up to her room. As a witness to it all, I have to be honest, I thought Grace was being outrageous. 
After all, Vivian's mother passed away not too long ago, so it was only natural to not accept the stepmother, right? But now Grace was messing things up and seemed to want to delete all of the images of Vivian's mother in this house. That wasn't cool. That evening I was reading The Theory of Everything in the garden when I felt a pat on my shoulder. I looked up to see Owen. Easton, I'm just letting you know that schools are all set up for you. You start next week. Then he added, Ah, you don't have a car yet, do you? I shall ask Vivian to give you a lift. You're in the same class anyway. Wait, what? I was actually going to the most prestigious and expensive school in the area? That's a dream come true, but I heard that all the other kids that went there were rich and influential. Could a poor guy like me adapt to the luxurious environment there? A feeling of uneasiness suddenly welled up in my heart. But then I told myself that everything would be fine. Monday morning arrived and I made sure I was ready early. I lingered around in the kitchen waiting for Vivian, but 30 minutes later and she still hadn't appeared. I started to panic, as I didn't want to be late on my first day. That was the type of bad first impression that would stick. I was about to walk to the bus stop when I saw Vivian slowly coming down the stairs. She winced at me and said, Oh, you're still here. I suppose you want to come with me then? I didn't answer and just followed her to the car. As soon as I sat down, she sped away. I hadn't even fastened my seatbelt yet which I then tried to do in a fumbled panic. Every time she pressed down on the accelerator, my heart skipped a beat. Then after some hellish ten minutes, she stopped the car. Whew! I was still alive. But hang on. This wasn't school. I turned to Vivian and stammered to ask her, but she cut me off. Get out of my car, and if you dare tell anyone how you know me, you will pay! Then she raised her fist to my face. Wow, she didn't have to be that aggressive. But fine, anyway. I didn't want to have anything to do with her either. As I briskly walked to school, I found myself worrying that this would be like it was in the movies, and I'd be teased for being the newbie. The school came into view, and damn. It was even more spectacular in real life. I took a deep breath to muster up the courage to enter the school. The grandeur and beauty of the place was so overwhelming. I was used to graffiti-covered desks and a jam locker door. Not here. Even the restroom door signs were expensive looking. I was wandering aimlessly trying to find my classroom when suddenly I saw this girl walk ahead and drop something. I picked it up and called after her. Sorry, is this yours? The girl turned around then squeaked out. Oh my God, thank you. You're my knight in shining armor. I can't live without my glossy lipstick. Then she started doing this odd pose. Then she pouted and flicked out her hair. Was this a rich girl thing? It was very confusing, but hey, I guess she seemed nice. I smiled at her, then turned to walk away. That's when I noticed the groups of girls in the corridor. They were all staring at me, and one of them even winked. Then I overheard some of them talking about me. One of them said, Ooh, he's cute. And another said, It's about time we had a new hot boy in this school. Well, girls from rich schools were weird. I know I'm quite a good-looking guy, but... I'd never had girls act like this toward me before. I chuckled inwardly and went to find my class. It seemed inevitable that my school life was destined to be rather, um, interesting. Hi, I'm Ella, and I'm 17. Have you ever been brave enough to change the things that you were too familiar with? If yes, did you encounter any difficulties? Well, for me, yeah. It's more than just changes, and this is the story of what happened to me last summer. And it's really crazy, so brace yourself. So, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. When I say small, I mean it. It only had a population of 85 people. There was just one gas station, two small parks, one grocery store, and, oh yeah, only one school. Including me, there were only seven kids in my grade. That's right, seven people. And my grade was one of the biggest ones. From when I was five years old to the time I was 15, I spent most of my time with the same six classmates. After being with them for many years, most of them really started to get on my nerves. Well, apart from Rosie. Rosie and I became BFFs in third grade. Some other kids were teasing me about my red hair, 
and told me that I looked like a tomato. But then Rosie appeared by my side and told them to back off. From then on, we became best friends and were pretty much inseparable. My life was good. I felt safe in my little town where everyone knew each other. In a city, there were way too many people for my liking and too much pressure to be popular. And I didn't want that. I knew a small town life was the life for me. But then, when I was 16, everything changed. On one Saturday afternoon, I was at Rosie's house watching a movie when my parents called me and told me to come home at once. I thought this was kind of weird because my parents didn't usually call me to come home until it was late at night. And right now, it was only 4.30 p.m. What did they need me to come home for? I arrived home to find Jake, my brother, crying. I bursted out loud, What happened? What was going on? Seeing me totally in shock, my dad said, Ella, we have some news. What news was bad enough to make my brother, who wasn't the emotional type, cry? Did someone have a serious illness? Had someone died? Oh no. Had my beloved dog Sally died? Then he said, Ella, I've been offered a job in New York City. What? I yelled. And he's taking it. This is an amazing opportunity for us all. And moving out of this town will be good for us. It'll be a great adventure, Mom said. New York? The biggest city in the entire country? No, I couldn't move there. I didn't want a new adventure. I was perfectly happy where we live now. And I didn't want to leave. However much I sulked, shouted, or pleaded with my parents to stay, their minds were made up, and we were moving. Telling Rosie was horrible. She got so upset, and I felt awful about it. I didn't want to leave her, but what choice did I have? I spent my last day in town with her. We ate pizza, watched our favorite movies, played our favorite video games, and things like that. When it was time for me to leave, I gave her my unicorn plushie to remember me by. Then we cried into each other's arms and we promised to text each other every single day. So, I left the safety of my little town and moved to the city. Our new house was much smaller than my old one, but at least we could keep Sally. On my first day of school, I was terrified. There were so many people and I didn't know where I was meant to go or what I was meant to do. Luckily, the kids there were actually really nice. This one girl showed me where my locker was, and some other kids let me sit with them at lunchtime. After only a few weeks of living in New York, I started to find my bearings. I even figured out how to navigate the underground. I made some pretty great friends, but this didn't change the fact that Rosie was still my BFF. I texted her every day, and sometimes we spent hours on the phone with each other. A month of city life passed. And I got talking to this boy in my English class called Alex. He had the most amazing blonde hair. And his eyes, they were blue like the sky and the ocean and a swimming pool. And yeah, if you couldn't tell, I really liked Alex. Not only was he unbelievably cute, but he was also kind and funny. We bonded over our love of video games and dogs and soon became pretty close. Then one day, he invited me over to his apartment to hang out. Then over a giant pizza and a movie, he told me he liked me and asked me to be his girlfriend. I instantly said yes! I was so excited and couldn't wait to tell Rosie, but she didn't seem all that thrilled about it. For a few months, everything was perfect for me. School life was great and I had some awesome friends and an amazing boyfriend. Sadly though, Rosie and I grew further apart. I barely had time to talk to her hours on the phone every night. It was like our timeline became different. She always called when I was busy, and when I texted her back, she wasn't there. I know that she always cared about me, but my busy life just carried me away. I told myself this was okay as things change. People get different friends. Though not as often as before, Rosie and I still chatted whenever we had a chance. One time I told her that I would be going out with Alex at a fancy restaurant the next day. Anytime I mentioned Alex, she seemed not cool with it. But that time she expressed her excitement and asked me a lot about our date. That made me feel so good. When the day came, I went to meet Alex at the restaurant that he had booked for us. I entered and waited for about 20 minutes for him to show. I began to get impatient and asked a waiter if he'd seen a boy with blonde hair and blue eyes come in at all. 
The waiter told me he had, but he'd left with a tall girl with long brown hair and brown eyes. What? Who was the girl he left with, and why? I thought of everyone I knew who fit that description. I couldn't think of anyone, except for Rosie. But she lived in Pennsylvania. Why would she be here talking to my boyfriend? I decided to call Alex, but he sounded muffled, and I heard a girl talking in the background. It sounded like they were arguing, and then the call ended. This was so weird. What happened? I had no idea what was going on, so I headed home. On my way, I felt like someone was following me. And then I realized that there was one car driving very slowly after me. When I tried stopping, it also stopped. Oh my god. Was it having anything to do with me? I felt terrified and started to run as quick as I could until I reached my house. I turned back and saw that car parked outside my house. I was shaking as I tried to open the door. And as I did, Sally zoomed past me and ran toward the car. I had only seen her act that way whenever Alex came over. She really liked Alex. Wait, Alex? That was it. Alex was in that car. Was it a prank? I ran over to see what the heck was going on. There, sitting in the driver's seat, was Rosie. And to my complete shock, Alex was tied up in the back seat. Rosie! I screamed. What are you doing here in New York with my boyfriend? Alex screamed, help! She told me you were waiting for me in her car, then she kidnapped me. Rosie quickly turned around and looked me right in the face. Oh, um, hi, Ella. What are you doing with my boyfriend? He's not a good guy for you, Ella. I need you to break up with him now, or else I will drive away so you can never find him ever. Are you crazy? We will not break up just because you demand me to do that. Now let him go. I walked around to the passenger door to get Alex, but then the car started moving fast. I ran after the car, but I was too slow. But Sally ran after it too, and she didn't stop. She almost got hit by cars as she ran through traffic until she was out of sight. I was so scared. I was about to call the cops when I saw a police car zoom past me. How did they know about this already? Who called 911? I looked back and saw my mom standing outside with the phone waving at me nervously. She had seen all the commotion and called the cops. Thanks, Mom. There was nothing I could do now except wait. It was awful. I was so anxious. About an hour later, a cop car pulled up to our house. The cop stepped out and opened the back door and... Out came Sally. I ran up to the police car and hugged Sally. She was safe, but what about Alex? The officer told me that they'd chased the car for almost two miles until they cornered it on a dead-end street. He said that Rosie was very fierce and tried resisting arrest, but they'd taken her to the station. To my relief, Alex was fine, and they dropped him back home. Phew. I just didn't understand it. Rosie was my best friend. Why would she try to seriously harm my boyfriend? I later found out that Rosie was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. It's a disorder that causes people to go through extreme mood swings and do things that are out of character and crazy. Rosie had a lot going on. As well as me not being around anymore, her dad had moved out. I didn't know this as she hadn't told me. Back then, I wasn't talking all that much to her, but I'd never expected that the separation Rosie felt was too much for her and could lead her to bipolar disorder. I was her only one at that time, so she wanted her to be my only one too. But Alex appeared and made her feel insecure and seriously jealous. It is fortunate there are no serious consequences. I really hope Rosie gets the proper treatment for her disorder. We might not be as close anymore, but in my eyes, she'll always be the girl who was there for me when I was being teased. And I will always regret that I wasn't there to listen to her more when she needed me. I still feel sad about it all. But I'm trying to see the positives. Things with Alex are going great, and I'm happy here. It turns out city life is for me after all. Whether it's in friendship or love, people still need their own space. And sometimes, as sad as it is, people do grow apart. This happens in life. Being overjealous doesn't help mend things. It just pushes the other person further away.